briefly uh, kind of anecdotal experience, but I, I won't name the specific universities, but we had one case where you had a PI that was really interested in moving forward with a kind of academic collaboration that he had been pursuing informally, and he had, he had some background IP from the university, wanted to continue moving forward with collaboration with medicinal chemi chemists, so there was one university where kind of core IP originated in the UK, and they were collaborating with this uh, medicinal chemistry group in Eastern Europe. And this was kind of funded through, um, or was, was looking to be funded through the DSI space, and it was, you get into a position where you have universities trying to value what they have because now there's interest in this piece of technology. They often have completely different ideas that are you know, also not necessarily aligned with reality about what the technology is worth, the risk associated, and just getting the two universities to actually communicate and agree on a way forward um, I mean, there were dialogues happening for nine months and that eventually broke down. We decided to discontinue the collaboration. But the really unfortunate thing in this case is that you simply have, you know, like, in some ways, everyone's trying to look after the, their own interest. But the result of that is kind of the most net negative thing for everyone. So the research doesn't go forward, none of the universities win, the technology doesn't get licensed. And it's this complexity that is just intrinsic to you know, global academic collaboration when it comes to translation, I think is something that really needs to be addressed uh, in, in a systemic way because it's, it's extremely unfortunate. This, is, you know, this would have been a, a project for a therapeutic that would have no doubt had utility to a, you know, a large patient population. So it's incredibly unfortunate, but I think this is a story kind of often told. Yeah, and unfortunately it's not the only one. We have seen quite a few of those stories as well. Uh, as a recipient. Uh, so do we have any questions from the audience? Anything you would like to ask any of the participants? Yeah. Thank you for the discussion. I'm just curious about like, um, in terms of commercialization, how do you deal with the two different environments where you have like on one hand, the more traditional academia environment, maybe in like a large university, and on the other hand, you have like a very agile startup, um, startup in, in like commercial environment. So, how do you? What's your kind of approach to that? How do you like align those two, or um, yeah, just some practical learnings maybe? Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure if, if uh, that answers. It, is, it will not be the solution all the time, but one of the new ways that uh, we try, we're, we will try to work on this is uh, Nucleate's partnership with Molecule, uh, with Thailand there, uh, where Molecule has agreed to essentially educate and train six Nucleate's uh, participants uh, or uh, team members all over the world to be the facilitators of a communication between a spin-off, a uh, DAO, and the TTO. So to, to train these six people and to try, them, to try out whether this can work and, and to find a commonality and, and if nothing works then all of the groups will be just more educated uh, from, from this. So this will be a six month program uh, if I remember correctly and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested in what the results uh, what, what will uh, come to that. Tyler, do you want to add something about the program? Yeah, so I, I think this speaks directly to, like, the, the short answer to that question is basically education. So it's when you look at many researchers who work in basic science, or maybe are, are dipping into translational science for the first time, they're, the way they work in the modus operandi has historically been towards publishing a paper. And actually, this is at the root of, of many issues. So I mean, like, um, academics often patent in order to publish, which means that a lot of the patents that are actually sitting within tech transfer offices aren't really right for commercialization anyway. So I think it actually starts very, very early when a project is conceptualized, trying to bring in individuals that understand what it takes to actually translate the technology, what the commercial landscape looks like, the type of assays that you need to do, that the way that you need to be thinking, understanding how VCs are going to be thinking, understanding how you know, all of the kind of checkboxes that you need to check in order to have a, 
I think, a successful time. And you know, there, there's, there's a book called, I believe it's The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, which was basically, it was his, uh, he developed frameworks that made surgery much, much safer, at least talked about the development of these, these kind of checklists that helped make surgery much safer, that were adapted initially for aviation. And it sounds almost ridiculous because it sounds like such a simple solution, but actually just having an awareness very early on through things like basic checklist communication, uh, things like having a nucleate fellow or someone actually facilitating their to answer questions, I think makes a huge difference. And, and you, you, I mean, this is my bias, obviously, but you really want to help people begin to operate probably more and more like an agile startup and less and less like a university trying to publish a paper when it comes to actually doing product development or, or, or technology translation. And I would say, if you look at programs go globally, Stanford Spark being, a, I think, a great example. Those kind of innovation offices that have really succeeded with technology translation have kind of adopted that mindset. So, yeah, just really firmly believe it's education. Yeah, I think where we usually start is that in the end, I would, I would claim that the entrepreneurial mindset and scientific method are quite close to each other. So, so if you look at the components, they're similar. I, I think there's a, a huge difference in terms of the time span. Uh, that things are needs to be developed due to the, the kind of logical venture capital when, when you actually start the company. Uh, but what we have seen uh, to, to work really, really nicely is that because uh, indeed uh, we, are, we so we build the cases on top of the, the research projects that are about to, to, to spin out, but then we also include the researchers uh, as mentors for the students, but we also bring in venture capital investors uh, as, as kind of secondary, uh, or and, and, and judging the, the end results. And, and this has worked really nicely for the researchers, because they come in as experts, but then by accident they basically get feedback uh, on, on the, the readiness level of their research and how they should think about it from a commercial perspective. And you can see when they have those small aha moments and, 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 and when, when their project takes a, takes a new direction. So I think, from, from my perspective, it can be difficult to, to do it in a, in a very structured manner, because I think what, what, what you can tell me if, if you agree, but I, I think most scientists, uh, before they make the decision to actually start the company, they're quite busy with their careers. Uh, so so they're, they're, they're not that likely to join a six month or even three month or even a couple of hours program. So, so I think they're quite, uh, knowledgeable about how they use their time, so so that has worked quite well. So we try to keep it to a minimum, but when they when they arrive, uh, we try to provide those nuggets that then transform how they think, and I think that also then results in them wanting to learn more and wanting to understand why is it this way or why do I have to learn this and that. So basically, you're tricking researchers into getting valuable feedback. That's the takeaway. <laughs> It wasn't, uh, so, so this makes me sound very particular, but yeah, it wasn't intentional, but, but yes, this has been one of the positive yeah. side effects that we've been able to create, so. That's really valuable. Yeah, also, yes. uh, do you have any uh, last messages, I think we have to wrap up, uh, unfortunately, uh, that you would like the audience to take with them? Yes, I know one. Uh, so, so I think what, what we should think about in this region in particular is that um, I would claim that more or less all tech transfer offices here have copy-pasted the ways of working first from, from the US, then maybe taken, taken some, some clues from, from Israel and, and, and some from the UK. But I would like to remind all of you that I think here as well it's, it's either super cheap or, or, or free to, to study and you have access to different types of grants and so on and so forth in Finland we basically get paid to, to study. And if you look at the, the system that we built our universities in Europe, that's very different from the US system. And I think this allows us, if we're able to really have a, a societal dialogue, to look at research the same way as we look at students. So, so the way I see it, we look at students, the way we, the, the reason why we invest in the students is that we look forward to them becoming productive taxpaying citizens. 
So I would, I would like for all of you to think about, can, why can't we look at uh, research-based inventions or innovations in the same way? If those get quicker into society, we'll have companies that provide jobs, that pay taxes, that, that create prosperity in the whole region. And I think this is really where we could make a huge difference and, and where we could kind of flip it a bit, because I think we're, we're lagging behind uh, in, in, in many ways, the US and, and we have China and, and India and whatnot coming from left and right, but we still have very high quality research here. So I think this is an opportunity that we should tap into quite quickly uh, in order to remain competitive. <laughs> That's all the climate crisis. <laughs> Mine is really short. It's just to think about what impact in research does an article have compared to what, when it's taken into practice. So I think that is one, one of the crucial parts that needs to be reminded to scientists why they do research, why did they start. And I think, I think that, uh, very shortly, that, that's the main, main, main topic that needs to be reminded to, to actually achieve what they set up to achieve in the first place. Oh, mine's going to be a little bit of a shameless plug for, for g side. <laughs> um, I would say anyone who's curious about the space that hasn't actually meaningfully engaged with it, I would encourage you to join a Discord server from one of the projects in the space, um, because I think you'll experience firsthand um, one, an amazing community that's actively trying to solve a lot of these problems, and two, possibly, yeah, find yourself um, a way to contribute uh, as well. And so it's just, if you're a person who's kind of frustrated by the status quo or sees room for improvement in the current system, I think joining one of these communities and the people speaking from, from several of them today could just be a great way to, to get your feet wet and, and begin to understand what the space is about. Yeah, so do get involved. And I would think that there's hope that uh, more and more organizations uh, try to educate, especially the young, uh, uh, researchers. So I would think that you know we can get at least closer to solving these problems in the future. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, comments, find our panelists. Maybe Tyler is a bit trickier, but I guess I'm on this. I'm on Discord as, as Tyler. Yeah. I live in the internet, so you can you can send me a message there, and I'm happy to engage anyone who's interested. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Now we will continue with actually presenting organizations that are actually living on the internet and connected. So next up is Eleanor Davis from Vita Dow, and that's the Vitality Research through Decentralized Science. Welcome. Um, evaluate and um, 
build our companies and basically kind of coordinating our uh, community of people around those initiatives. Um, so previously I was uh, in the founding team and chief operations at LabDAO and then prior to falling down the rabbit hole of decentralized science, my um, I was previously in the tech industry, a long day, working in fund operations, uh, building companies, and then prior to that, so my bio experience comes from working in healthcare and biotech consulting for mid to large cap transactions. My interest in longevity, however, has been long standing and it's kind of more of a side passion, so I'm very fortunate to be in the space where I can kind of nurture that. So, firstly, why do you sign for aging? So, I mean, aging is something that affects all of us. Um, aging diseases and frailties, uh, frailty um, and universal issues, we're all going to, it's all going to happen to us uh, at some point. And so, why does it have to be within the confines of specific institutions, whereas it could actually be more easily democratized and basically le leveraging the, um, the wisdom of the crowds in order to help mitigate and find cures, treatments for age-related diseases. Longevity bias for yours would further that immense returns, if not on the health side, but also on an economic standpoint as well. So, um, longevity medicine will dramatically improve the quality of life and everyone should basically have access to it. And Visa now is enabling longevity by the people for the people, and um, we're essentially utilizing web free blockchain in order to do that. And so, a bit about VisaDAO. Um, at a glance, we funded 23 projects now uh, with 4.5 million. So, I actually updated the slide from yesterday because it did a big portfolio update since then. Um, 4.5 million now. Um, we have 13 core members, 3,200 token holders, and over 11,000 people in our community. And so the really cool thing about VitaDAO is that with our token, Vita, um, <clears throat> community members are able to govern, um, help make decisions, uh, if not on the deal flow side of things, but also on the community side of things. And this we have access to better education, information, and also feel a sense of ownership and as to where the field of longevity research is going. We also have a number of so, friends, strategic partnerships, um, such as Longevity Biotech Fellowship, also um, so the, uh, the portfolio companies that uh, we're operating in that, 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 we're, um, that, that, that we've supported, and uh, we're also kind of becoming more and more a part of the longevity ecosystem. And so this is our organizational structure. Um, this is actually the most up-to-date one. So we have three working groups, not seven. And so the first is longevity deal flow. And each of these working groups, by the way, are managed by somebody called a steward. And a real world equivalent would probably be, say, a department or a, yeah, a, a vertical, for instance. And the steward is basically the manager who's kind of the head of each uh, Domain. So the deal flow, we source, incubate, evaluate, um, and build companies. Um, so for community awareness, it's kind of more business development, outreach, ambassador status, <coughs> and coordination is more legal, more finance, tokenomics, etc. So a little bit about these are what we do in deal flow, so we are basically tackling aging with the power of a global community. And so, similarly to Venture Studio, except um, we're a DAO, we're open, and um, the beauty of that is being able to source, um, sorry, be, being able to tap into the community to source deals globally, so not just kind of confined to a specific uh, jurisdiction. And it also allows us to kind of tap into the gig economy of the community, um, which is 11,000, uh, it's super big, and um, be able to vet um, diligence deals uh, using basically more data points 
um, in order to make the best funding decisions. So the project's funded basically leads to uh, IP, commercialization, and um, the ways in which we can commercialize IP are done in three forms. So the first is via IP NFTs and IPTs, which Tyler spoke about. The second is uh, new those spinouts, um, so basically having an equity share in that, and also IP sub-licensing. And the royalties, uh, proceeds, uh, come um, off the back of these uh, monetization efforts that basically brought back into Draw back into the DAO, and that kind of becomes this self perpetuating, um, evergreen fund type of model whereby any monetary, um, any, any funding proceeds are taken back into the DAO and then reinvested, and then it just basically becomes this, um, this, this cycle. So, as I mentioned, we're powered by a global network. Kind of different to a venture studio or a VC traditionally. Um, 11,000 plus people, uh, specifically in Dealflow, uh, which is a lot more curated, there are roughly 700 people, a few of whom are uh, featured here. So we have Gary Gordon Nova, who is in the scientific team of one of our spin outs, as well as Walton, who is also a BI and a lot of other projects. Mike Brian, who is partner of Pfizer, who also backed these down. Um, and then a couple of our uh, members of our scientific advisory board. So we're the first money in with the highest upside potential. The check sizes for these DAO are typically 200 million. Um, previously, they've been a little <coughs> larger, those are the equity investments, we sort of stop that now. And um, we'll also be raising our sidecar fund to basically focus on equity. We're currently uh, focusing now on funding, spinning out, commercializing, and translational research. But we really value our capital. So the value that the community brings is basically being able to tap into key opinion leaders, academics, experts, um, VCs, biotech, industry veterans, in order to help troubleshoot projects um, when they kind of hit blockers, also be able to help them reach specific milestones and also be able to raise non diabetic funding via that IPT inside the property token mechanism. And so the intention is basically to develop this up to an inflection point where we can bring in um, institutional capital. So for instance, um, Pfizer Ventures uh, supported Visa DAO in order to basically be that partner. And we also have strategic investors in our ecosystem, such as um, Apollo, um, one of the partners is also part of our scientific advisory board, as well as our event, as well as Housebound Capital. And then a number of our portfolio companies, these are the equity, have gone on to raise uh, rounds led by the likes of RA Capital, the CCC, Longevity Vision Fund, um, post the out uh, supporting, so that's also failing. So a little bit about how we fund our ventures. This is, these are kind of the um, eligibility criteria of investment mandates, so to speak. So it's really kind of broad, but it's deliberately set in that way so that we kind of um, have a, a broad catchment area in order to find the diamonds in the rubble. And also longevity is quite broad in terms of definitions, so we really kind of want to find those key interventions. So longevity fit, team excellence, uh, scientific viability is a really big one as well, that's super important for us. Um, just to have good, defensible IP positioning. Um, there's a lot of kind of snake oil uh, stuff that's out there, so we don't want to fund that. Commercial potential, uh, project feasibility, and application quality. And so, um, I did this little picture of the moon here because um, we basically look at the moon shots in order to enable more shots from Gog. And the whole intention of um, Visa Down as well is to uh, go for those really high risk but potentially super high reward blockbuster longevity interventions. So we source, evaluate, and incubate the best early stage aging research. We're looking for translational moonshots. 
projects undergo a three-phase governance process, which we'll go into a little bit later. As I mentioned, the, the typical funding checks are 90 to 250k, and the typical agreements, um, as Tyler also mentioned earlier, are sponsored research agreements, also sponsored development, joint development, and broadly sharing and be licensing uh, with the, the overarching goal of spinning out as a leased out operated company. And so this is the funding timeline. Um, as, I, as I mentioned yesterday, it's, we're kind of bringing the, the back end of what happens in the venture studio towards the front end. And it's also a really good way as well for anybody who's curious about going into the, the biotech venture field to come in, help source, help build, help build and steals, pick the two. And also the hierarchy of these data is super flat. So you're basically in the same room as um, industry veterans who are able to, you know, kind of get their two cents on a specific project, uh, bring in their experience, and it's a really, really good way in order to learn. So pre qualification and due diligence committee presentations, we have Friday pitch calls, these are for the academic projects and also for the startups. And it's a really good way as well I mean, for companies, teams to get feedback from the likes of our SFB. And also key opinion leaders in the community as well. What really great has been on a couple of the um, <coughs> pitch calls as well, which has been uh, really interesting. And then this is, like I said, community vote. Uh, voting is basically done in so two stages of soft voting and then a final token, uh, token vote, which is with beta token. And this kind of goes into a little bit more. So it's ideation, specification, and then consensus. Our senior review is also a super key uh, part of the deal flow process and is very similar to a peer review process. We have over 50 senior reviews, each from different industry backgrounds, so VCs, um, market access, FDA regulatory, academic, um, biotech, pharma, and we basically lean on this expertise in order to do risk uh, research um, and highlight the, the key areas where there's opportunity for the project and also offer areas where there could be potential downfall, how to refine the project and how we can work on that. And this is a snapshot of our portfolio as it stands. The focus currently is on spin outs. There will be quite a few more coming out this year and next year. One of the most recent ones is Vision Pharma, which is up there. So the PI is uh, so former Stanford, Art and Bio, another really cool one, which I'll go into shortly. And that's also the next IPC launch that Tyler referenced earlier, too. Matrix Bio is our first, um, first spin out that I also work on and also led the the legal corporate structuring, um, the legal compliance as well, so who's to speak to that in some detail. The IPNFTs and IPTs are the more research projects. Autophagy activators was done in collaboration with Newcastle University and was also our first IPT. And also our startups as well. So for those of you who follow the life sciences news, Rubedo actually recently raised a 40 million round and um, have entered into a collaboration with Biosdorf as well, which is uh, a really good, um, yeah, really good uh, breakthrough for the longevity industry. So I've done a tap on some more recent ventures. Carol, as I said, was um, is our first IPNFT, IPT. We just buy our first spin out, and we'll also be um, another IPT, which will be coming out this year for when they're, for when they're, uh, for when they're raising for financing. Exception um, was the company that I mentioned that's raised a follow on round led by RA Capital. And Security is actually one of our ventures which is closest to clinical trials. So this is a snapshot of our portfolio. Um, I know it's quite information dense, so I'll speak to it only at a high level. But um, basically, 
The funding that we've done for uh, identities and spin outs basically matches the startups. Um, <coughs> you can kind of see what our average check size is for uh, each of those different types of um, ventures. And also, if anybody's interested in seeing the portfolio breakdown in more detail, um, I can yeah, give you access to that as well. And so I referenced our scientific advisory board. We're actually the first DAO, the first buyer, I believe, to have a scientific advisory board. And so we had three people from Pharma who are on the board. So that's Mike, who is also part of that. He's also part of Pfizer. In fact, he's a DAO. There's also Simon Fantatini, who is um, so he's CSO of Novartis, and he's also leading his own uh, his own DAO now. It's called Synapse DAO. And that also focuses on um, incubating and building sleeping innovation found in pharma institutions and in companies. It's very cool. There's also uh, part of them um, who's from Sanofi, so another pharma person, and then uh, Diane Simons, who's a very active um, a contributor in deal flow and also a senior reviewer. She's a really valuable member. Jack Scannell, who actually coined the term e rooms law. Uh, Kelsey Moody, who um, basically is a CRO in the longevity space. And Alexandra Bowser, who is one of the partners at Polar VC. And then everyone was from SAB. So you heard a little bit about VCFAST and the project lab. So initially, the, uh, and then this is kind of a, a good success story for. Um, the power of IPTs and also the deep interest. So we initially raised 30K for the Visa Fast token and currently the market cap is 5.5 million, um, which is you know, quite good um, in terms of the attention that it's, that it's attracted and also the ability to see a, um, a high valuation for uh, the project. You've seen the slide before, so I won't dwell on it too much, but basically this is the utility of the IBMFTs and the IBTs and the fact that you basically raise not only to fund it to de risk your company to an inflection point, where you can raise um, institutional capital and also have enough energy and shares that are paid away for, um, for the team and also for follow on investment. Matrix Bio and Arsenal Bio are our first two spin outs. The Matrix Bio was done with, um, in partnership with uh, Rochester University, which also just goes to show that there is potential to bring this innovative model forward to university TTOs and um, to encourage adoption. We've also found in, um, in negotiations with university TTOs that when you bring this new model forward to them, there's a sense of excitement and also a um, interest in the drive towards innovation and the utility of crypto in, this, uh, in the industry of uh, biotech. Our time bio is um, our second uh, spin out, led by Anthony Schwartz and Jonathan Torres, both are really prolific um, biotech industry operators. Very strong track record, which is just goes to show the, um, the adoption um, and also the leveling up of, of the model. So it's not just company building and deal flow in VCAL, but also we have uh, several other initiatives in terms of um, access to non led funding and also spot up funding. There's the longevity prize. This is a really good kind of precursor for scientists who um, whose work is still kind of not yet ready. If you're familiar with the TRL technology readiness level, um, by TRL three. So if you're kind of just a little bit before that, but it needs some um, kind of looking for extra funding, the longevity prize is a really good way to do that. The longevity is also our overlay journal, and uh, they basically run through. Um, a long list of uh, longevity papers, and they basically have curators select the top papers. This is less translational, but it's um, it's, a, it's a really good way in order to see what the 
curators, so key, key leads in longevity, um, are interested in and are finding interesting. And there's also um, a funnel for the deal flow um, for uh, the DAO. And there's also the Lisa DAO longevity and design uh, symposium as well, which uh, we should look out for in the of this year. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, if you want to get in touch, these are my socials, and you can find more via the QR code.
one night last night, um, and so that you waited here uh, this morning and, and in the morning is really fantastic, in my opinion. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, those of you who are just joining us, um, welcome. Uh, you know, I'm not from Tallinn, so I can't like, welcome you to Tallinn on behalf of Tallinn, but also this is an incredible city, so um, welcome. Uh, yeah, I'm from Asterisk. Uh, I am the founding member, uh, and we are addressing the massive data gap that exists in non-reproductive women's health, which I will explain. Uh, so first of all, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been at it since 2010. I entered the entrepreneurial space the hardest way you could by founding a nonprofit organization. <laughs> Uh, that lasted for two years. We did four projects and two um, fundraising galas. And so it was like a nice, you know, general experience. Then I founded a tech company called Green Cup Digital. It still exists. I'm extremely proud of it because I exited in 2018. Managed to sell to a fellow female entrepreneur, which is unheard of in tech, as many of you know. So um, very happy with that outcome. I'm an anthropologist by trade. Um, I published one book in the anthropological space. I particularly study paradigm shifts, which is why I'm so keen on being in Web3 because we are in a paradigm shift. And so I would love trying to translate the space into Web2, Web1, and you know just analog. Um, so that, that fires me up if you want to play with that. Let's do it. Um, but I started Asperger's because I have a personal experience as well with a female-specific disorder that is little studied and little understood despite it affecting 12% of women, uh, which is equivalent to how many women also have diabetes, which we all know very well because uh, it's a sex agnostic disorder. So that gives you a little bit of an understanding just right off the bat as to what's happening in women's non-reproductive health. That if it is female-specific, there's basically no research, no awareness, or no understanding. I've been told by doctors that I'm crazy, even though I have research documents showing this is a real thing. But we'll get into that. So first of all, what do I mean by non-reproductive health? So I've had uh, some fun questions over the past four days. <laughs> How long have we been at it since Banana Town started? I got to Tallinn on Friday last week. So since then, I've been trying to describe what's non-reproductive health. Because 500 years ago, Western health was founded based on the idea that women are just little men, thus do not need to be involved in clinical yep. trials. I see many women grinning because they know this and it's painful. Um, what this means is that we have a lot of missing data and we also associate women's health with two parts of the body. It's called bikini medicine because that is the part of the body that a bikini covers. So when I say non-reproductive health, often people are very confused because we haven't thought about the female body as unique except for boobs and women. So that's what we're interested in with asterisks. Our vision then is to see women's non-reproductive health impartially and fully supported worldwide. And this is why we love Web3 because we can actually reach populations that have been traditionally left out of Western medicine. We're not interested in being white saviors. We are not interested in science for the global north. We are interested in all women's health. So as I have said, women's health is currently poorly researched and poorly understood outside of two very specific areas. To that end, currently 88% of female-specific disorders in animal trials use male animals. This is crazy to me. 74% of sex-specific research is going towards male-specific disorders. It's good, I mean, we need the research, but we also need the research. And 80% of femtech startup funding is going towards reproductive health. Again, this is good and this is needed, but there is a whole body here and it is affected by the modalities, the medicines, and the knowledge that we have in this space. So as I said, we've had this idea of bikini medicine. Obviously, this phrase was coined recently 
the idea is fairly old, but we haven't had bikinis since what, like 1920s, 1930s. So obviously the term is new, the idea stands, until 1993 when the United States led the way in legislating a mandate that women be involved in clinical trials. Just to clarify, in the 1970s and 1980s, women of reproductive age were actually banned from clinical studies uh, because of a fear of a potential fetus, even if a woman was on birth control or abstention or anything. Um, which also speaks to science's trust in a woman's ability to recognize that she's pregnant. So, um, <laughs> This leads to these types of problems. Who heard about the Ambien fiasco? Nobody. Okay, sweet. Yes. Okay, so this one then. So Ambien is a sleep drug. Uh, it came out in the late 90s. It was only tested on men. So women started going psychotic at it, which is really fun, because it turns out that the dosage for men is actually double what a woman's body can metabolize and process. So, 20 years later, the FDA resolved and amended the dosage for Ambien for women. And this is why we're called asterisk. Because the dosage is X, asterisk, unless for a female. It's tongue in cheek. I'm spicy, can you tell? I'm very, I'm inspired up about this. This is why I found an organization around it. Um, when it's time to diagnosis, men on average get diagnosed for a disorder between two to four years from time to initial seeking of support, women four to eight years. So we're looking at double uh, the time frame in order to get a diagnosis. Um, in some cases, it goes on and on and on. And this is a data problem, in my opinion, at least in our opinion here at Astros. If we have more knowledge and more information about what a woman's body is doing in reaction to environment or medication or anything else, like aging, then we have a higher likelihood of getting diagnosed sooner. And the misdiagnosis uh, is quite rampant. Um, women in the room, have you ever been told by your doctor, I don't know, or you're crazy? Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it happens. Um, and it happens a lot. Um, and so even when I do show up with clinical trials to support um, my disorder, I'm told that it's not a thing. So misdiagnosis is too rampant. Again, we need more data. Uh, so this is a basic overview of what we're working on behind the scenes. We are public but still in stealth mode because our white paper comes out next month. Wink, wink. Um, but this is what we're aiming towards. First of all, as I said, backfilling missing data. We're looking at data lake technology and zero knowledge computing in order to do this. I'll get to that. Um, resuscitate the dusty IP stuck behind the walls of universities. As we just heard, tech transfer is broken. Uh, and we have tons of data that is in existence that's just kind of sitting there because it's not desired. Um, maybe there's some commercial mechanisms that are in place to bring it out, et cetera, et cetera. So we really want to take a look at how we can deal with that. Um, and eventually, we would love a vertical where we are funding our own member-voted research. Um, for me, this means that women, for the first time, will be voting on their own health care. What an idea! So data lakes, um, we, we believe that if we can build disease-specific data lakes from women around the world, uh, we can start to accelerate and backfill the data that we need in order to better understand female-specific disorders, but also female bias disorders. For example, obsessive compulsive disorder, it is a sex agnostic disorder, yet it affects women to one to men. Uh, within some of the subsets of OCD, like body dysmorphic disorder, that is a condition related to OCD, and yet it affects women overwhelmingly, right? So we have these uh, disorders that bias towards women heavily, um, fibromyalgia is another one, autoimmune disorders, right? So yes, they are sex agnostic, but we want to get into that space too because there's something going on and it's the research is just too slow, the data is um, and we also want to be BFFs with researchers because we are hopefully going to provide them not just the data that they have been starving for, but also a more cost-effective uh, way to get that data. 
So then, uh, looking at tax transfer, uh, we're going to become BFFs with a whole lot of universities as well in order to make that happen. Um, we have to, of course, grease the wheels for Web3. That's where I get to come in because I have to translate to universities what this industry is and why it is useful and important and exciting. Thank goodness there are some universities that have rolled out their own blockchain um, tracks, and so they have an idea that this is an important space, but we, when we get into traditional medicine, sometimes um, it's a little bit slower, which I don't know, no, for sure. Um, I'm really, really lucky that my co-founder has been in traditional medicine for over a decade and worked closely with Johns Hopkins uh, University and the Gates Foundation. So we're hoping that we can unlock those doors faster in order to grease the wheels for tech transfer and thus increase research. Because if we're able to demonstrate to universities that their dusty old women's on reproductive health data is useful, they're going to fund more of it. And then, of course, uh, funding our own research. Uh, this, personally, is my North Star. Um, not for the fact that we want to fund our own research, but to me, if I can get women around the world on all six continents, yes, and that, um, we're going for it, um, to be voting on their own health care, on the future of the modalities that we are supporting, that is mind-blowing. That's what we're so excited about with Web3, that we can have public participation for the first time in industries that have typically been cloistered. So we'll get there. Uh, you can tell I'm feisty, so we'll get there. Uh, who knows how fast. The market looks great for this. Um, we have 20 billion feeding into women's healthcare by 2030. Um, and in 2022, we had 121% increase. The numbers aren't out for 2023 yet. We will get those very soon, hopefully by the time we put out our own paper. But so, it's looking good. The money is there. I hate to have to go for a money pitch to say, this will make you money, thus do it. It's, it should be more like, hey, your mothers and sisters and aunts and best friends would be healthier if you support this. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to show the money in order to get people to move their tushes. So where are we now? Uh, we are in the process of reviewing our white paper with researchers and experts. Um, it is long, it is full of graphs and links and studies. You can tell I spent a long time with it. So we are publishing our white paper and presenting it for the first time in public at Law Split next month. If you are coming, please uh, make sure to check that out. Uh, there's a fantastic D-size track at Law Split. So if you haven't been to Law Split and you haven't applied to speak, Approach me afterwards. Uh, we need to get you there. The weather is also really nice in Croatia. <laughs> Just <laughs> um, and then we are also starting to develop our code repository in order to uh, bring our first model to market. <coughs> These are our four core contributors. We have a core team of sixteen currently. Um, yeah. So the funny thing is I was just describing to um, some folks at, this morning over coffee that most of us have never met in, uh, in person. I met Erin in person for the first time at Decide London last month, which was really fun. Uh, Katie has been, again, in MedTech for over a decade. Um, her previous startup had funded from Gates Foundation uh, and USAID and Just Have Kids. Um, Lena is an incredible translator. Uh, just like me, she she can take a brand identity and run with it. So she's heading up our comms team. We have other amazing people who are helping us to polish this white paper and get to market. Uh, but we, what we really need is legal counsel and uh, developers who are excited to hack on this. And so if you know anybody who's fired up like I am uh, about this space, we would love to talk to them. In the meantime, you can join us uh, at the QR code or on our website, on our social media. I highly recommend hopping into the newsletter. We're publishing bi-weekly repositories of female-specific disorders. We just published one this week on uh, female pain uh, and how very weird that space is. Uh, we have one coming up on sleep in two weeks, so I highly recommend hopping into our newsletter. That's also where you'll get to see the fun announcement about the white paper. Um, in the meantime, I'd love to field any questions because I think I do that 
moved through that super fast. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to connect with all of you. Thanks for being here again. Okay. Uh, initially analog or not published so that it becomes useful uh, 
able to um, apply in the space. So yes, early days though, early days on that. Thanks. <laughs>
where we look at biology as technology, specifically the genes, the proteins, the building blocks of life, and we use those building blocks to recreate new things. Um, those might be uh, like metabolic processes to produce chemicals or materials or to produce something physical, but it might also be a process to break something down, or it might be a medicine, for example. The possibilities are, are really endless, but the key principle is using biology as a design technology. And how do we actually get there? Well, it's, if you know biology, it's super complicated. It's not very programmatic in the same way that software seems to be. And so what can we do? Well, we have to build the building blocks in order to, to create these um, more complex solutions. So one of the things that we see is that the Earth Itself, the planet that we live on is one giant biological system. It's not, as I said, it's not discrete. There's not nature and us. We are all part of the same thing. And why do we need to see it that way? Because if we want to be truly sustainable, we have to understand and like, internalize our relationship with the world and the planet and stop seeing nature as something we need to run away from or control or manage, but something that we need to build a like, symbiotic relationship with. And I'd argue that the reason we're in such a sticky situation with the climate at the moment is exactly because we saw nature as a threat. So one of the things I like to I like to think about um, sometimes is how did happen, how we got here. And I would say that let's let's think back to the original uh, kind of civilizations. Everything was out there to kill us, right? Everything was dangerous, whether it was the weather, predators, poisonous plants. Everything wanted to kill us. So of course we've got this intrinsic fear of nature. But I think that really pushed us when we're building cities to yeah, kind of push nature out. Um, so what I want to see is, is nature more involved in what we do. But when we are looking at the Earth as this biological system, what we can also see is some of the like the components, what are the agents, what are they doing? And they're doing really, really interesting things. On the big scales, we've got organisms that are doing crazy things. I mean we have things that fly, isn't that crazy when you actually think about it? Um, but on the micro scale is where the even more interesting things are happening. So biology is really everywhere doing everything. And that seems like a, it might seem like an overstatement, but I can guarantee you almost anything that you can think of, whether it be a physical, chemical reaction, uh, biology has figured out a way to do it. Not only do it, but do it in a way that's sustainable, that's efficient, energy efficient, and they can replicate themselves. They, they produce something out of almost nothing. Um, and these building blocks are actually really powerful. So if we can start to use these building blocks to create things more rationally, then maybe we can clean up some of our mess. So this is a, a quote from George Church, uh, who is one of the uh, most famous people in synthetic biology. And he said that everything, essentially everything that we can currently manufacture Without biology, we will eventually be able to manufacture with biology. Um, and I wholeheartedly believe that to be true. Um, and so, as I said, this is how the kind of process of symbio works. Um, so by reimagining biology, we can use it to solve, uh, to solve global challenges. So what we do is we look to nature to find those building blocks, whether those are whole organisms, proteins, genes, metabolic processes, that we can take as our kind of like software components. Um, and then we can use computational techniques, so computational biology, AI, deep learning, all of this awesome stuff to analyze that rich data um, and figure out what the hell any of it means and how we can then go backwards um, from what it means to actually making something meaningful. Um, and then we can put that technology into our living self, so it's kind of like updating the software of a cell and we can program them to do some really awesome stuff. So one of the things that we are particularly interested in at Valley Dow is the use of sustainable building blocks as fuel for all of these processes. And the outputs can be materials, foods, fuels, and medicines, but really practically anything that you can think of. And so that's why it makes something really, really interesting. If you heard our, our panel yesterday, I said that, um, one of the things that's so exciting about Symbio is it changes the paradigm of, of a climate problem into a climate opportunity. Because now suddenly carbon dioxide, methane, all of these 
polluting chemicals in the atmosphere and the world around us are fuel. They're fuel to create the things that we need and want in society. So you can imagine this actually gets investors really excited and it pushes people to action, uh, which yeah, we have not seen much of. But it wouldn't be a good intro to Symbio without giving some, some real life examples. So this is, uh, an, yeah, I'm gonna show you four or five different examples. This is, these are like just random selections, but some of my favorites and some of the ones that I think really show you how limitless this power is. So this one is chemical free fertilizer. If you know much about fertilizer, it's one, extremely pollutive to produce. Um, the the uh, process is yeah, like really, really uh, nasty for the environment. Obviously, because we do um, intensive agriculture, we do it on a mass scale, so that's producing a, a massive problem to the environment also. But the worst part of it is, we have this incredibly pollutive chemical that we want to use on our, on our crops, uh, and then we just pour it over the soil, so actually like 90% of it just gets washed away. And then that goes to pollute rivers, uh, streams, and we have like all of these downstream problems. But it's, it's crazy, it's crazy, and it's expensive, and it's pollutive. Um, so what these companies do, Pivot uh, Bioproven, um, or well, that's the product rather, it's essentially a, a engineered bacteria that can help the plant fix nitrogen. So it's a chemical-free fertilizer. So those cells are living in symbiosis with the plant, um, rather than having to actually add something constantly to the plant. This one is really crazy. So my um, undergraduate super, uh, research project supervisor went on to, he'd actually left the academic environment, went to work at this Australian company, Val, um, and they're changing the game. So you've probably heard about cultivated meat, black bro meat. Anyone here tried black bro meat? Nice. Any good? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the technology still has a long way to come, of course. Um, but one of the things that this company is doing is rather than trying to replace the meats and the things that we already have, it's trying to invoke imagination. Right? Have you ever wondered what a woolly mammoth tastes like? Probably many of you not. Uh, I'm one of really a carnivore, so I would love to dig my uh, my teeth into that. Um, but you know, they're creating these meats, uh, exotic meats, things that people can't try because it's either endangered or it's extinct. Right? Uh, so that's really cool. One of the craziest and most, uh, I, I think, just mind blowing applications of Symbio is this self replicating building blocks. Um, and it sounds made up, it's, it's not. I've seen several projects and several people working on this. It's obviously super early stage, so we don't see it right now, but they were producing these building blocks using cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are like kind of tiny little plant-ish cells, so they use sunlight and CO2 to, to grow biomass. Uh, but they built building blocks out of them, which divide and replicate, or you can cut it in half, and by the next day or a week later, you're gonna have two bricks instead of one. So imagine when you build your house, you just cut a piece off and plant some more, and it's gonna grow with your family, right? Like, it just completely changes the game. So it's not just about replacing things that we already do, it completely changes the paradigm of buildings, because now you don't have to extract and, and go out and like, ruin everything to build a building. It's, it's literally, we build one building, and then it's gonna grow with us. Xenobots, um, so this is Dr. Michael Levin. He is a crazy, crazy researcher doing some really sci-fi stuff. Um, so what he's been building is these self-replicating biological robots, uh, which are essentially engineered skin cells. So he's edited their genes in ways where he can alter their behavior. So they're testing them on mass scale, all of these different like prototypes that are doing different random, usually random things. But then when you start to analyze that data and you can filter and select for the right ones, then you can find ones that are doing things that are a little bit less random. Uh, and that's kind of how evolution works anyway. But they managed to develop these self-replicating biological robots that they can program and actually control with external forces, whether those are electricity or chemical stimulants. Uh, and these will autonomously, they will replicate themselves, but they'll go and clean up or collect pollutants or chemicals and do this like awesome stuff. So yeah, if you've ever watched sci-fi movies and you see these uh, nanobots, they usually call them, and they inject them in their blood and they repair their bodies, well, they're on their way. 
Um, and this is something that I just personally want because I love fashion, I love clothes, and I love like exciting stuff. Can you imagine having a jacket that changes colour while you move around? Um, or breathes and cleans the environment with you? Crazy stuff. So to make all of this happen, uh, we need jeans, we need to be able to print jeans. Um, so here you have the 3D printer equivalent of uh, for synthetic biology, which is the desktop DNA printer. So this exists, I've seen it, I've touched it, um, and they sell them. Quite expensive still, but of course those prices are going to come down as the technology progresses, and maybe we're going to be doing this all at home ourselves at some point. Um, and then you can't just use genes, right? Like you need the genes to program something that's alive and actually uh, replicating. So what we use for those is bioreactors. Um, and this is a project where, yeah, I, I've actually said this is the 3D printer equivalent because now we're going from printing genes to actually printing molecules or cells or things that can do other things. But why isn't it taking off? Um, there are a number of reasons. Uh, You've heard many of them today already, so I won't spend too much time on them. Uh, but what I will focus on is this lack of translation, because that's really where Valley Dow and a lot of the Vibe Dows are focused right now. Um, so, yeah, I'll skip through these. So, what is Valley Dow doing to support all of this? Um, we are, of course, the decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, members can decide the direction of what we do. Um, we try and use uh, the GROW token, is our token. Um, we use that to align incentives and get people activated around supporting this type of research. Um, and we enable them to pull essentially capital, resources, and network. Those are the three like, key components of, of everything we do, and we would not survive without them. Um, of course, we're offering funding to, to research projects in the same way that we did out. Uh, and the asterisk now is, um, and those research projects that we fund that eventually get either they get spun out into a company or IP is generated, and it, down either of those routes is how we kind of capture the, the value from those investments. So yeah, this is a, probably a familiar diagram because it looks quite like the the Vita that one. I mean, it's it is essentially the same thing. Except, of course, we have slightly different needs. We're not working with developing drugs. We are developing things and tools to be able to, to clean up our environment. And those take a slightly different life cycle. I think one of the benefits and of what we do, as opposed to having a pharma, is that we don't have to deal with as many regulatory hurdles because, in most cases, we're not producing things for human consumption that are going to directly impact human health. <clears throat> so rather than talk about how we do it, um, as I said, we've heard a lot of that already. Just wanted to give some examples of what we uh, have actually been working on. So these are a few of our, our projects uh, that we've worked on already. And I'll tell you that there's slightly different models in each of them. So the first one is a IPNFT. So this is a research project that we went out, we sourced, we evaluated, we decided we wanted to fund it, and we are funding it. Um, it's in collaboration with Imperial College London. And the idea is that over time, a two, roughly two year project, that is going to generate IP. And that IP is going to be um, very, very useful. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the project in a moment. Um, the next two are more spin out focused. So actually, they, I think, yeah, we didn't give any funding to the first one, the high performance fluorinated biomaterials. We uh, used a sweat equity model for that one. So we went out, we helped the academics that had some IP lying around. Um, they had no intention of commercializing it, which is the case, in a, uh, which is often the case. And we helped them hire their C team, helped them apply for grants, accelerators, get their next uh, funding steps. And they've just uh, last year been accepted onto the, uh, oh, been given 500K from the Bio Innovation Institute. Um, and that's like non dilutive as well so yeah they're already doing really well that's super exciting and then we have this chat GPT for synthetic biology so this is a sister software platform that enables people to use natural language to design these things so as I spoke about earlier we need to go out we need to find those building blocks we need to repurpose them but the design process is super complicated it's not very rational so uh, or at least it is rational but 
there's a lot of guesswork and there's a lot of randomness still. So being able to make that whole process easier and intuitive is kind of the accelerator. Like it's going to open up and unlock so many different things. Um, so this is a, a software platform for exactly that purpose. So <coughs> this is our flagship, flagship project uh, with Imperial College London, as I mentioned. So this one. <coughs> Me, is uh, focused on the sustainable production of palm oil, um, which is a slightly misleading title because that's not all it is. Um, but essentially, the, um, the project is a metabolic engineering project, so we're designing a strain of yeast. So in the same way that you brew beer, you'll be able to essentially brew microbial lipids. And why are microbial lipids interesting? Well, there's a hundred or hundreds of thousands of different applications for them. Uh, our first and most interesting application, of course, is palm oil, because if you know much about palm oil industry, it's incredibly pollutive. Um, they are literally chopping down the Amazon rainforest forest as we speak, by the minute, uh, to, to create these palm oil plantations. And palm oil, palm oil is everywhere. Like, you can't avoid it, really. It, even if you want to. It's in, uh, it's in a lot of food products, and, and it's just there because it, it works and it's cheap. It, it provides a, a very specific purpose. So we wanted to focus our first like, batch of microbial lipids on that, but the nice thing is this, this is a platform, right? So we design the strain, and then we can reprogram that strain. We can update the software, and instead of producing lipids for uh, palm oil production, we could produce them for uh, cosmetics, for biofuels production, for example. So yeah, this is a, a super interesting project. And as I said, there's going to be tons of applications. And this is why it works as an IPFT as well, right? Like there's a, a bunch of different stakeholders that are going to be interested in this over time, a bunch of different applications. So having one company own all of the IP and just like hog it and hold on to it makes no sense. Uh, so we really want to increase the impact of this particular project by using the decentralized model. Um, so this is our academic spin out that I mentioned that raised 500k long time funding from the Bio Innovation Institute. So this one is slightly different. They are focused on high performance fluorinated biomaterials. If you know about uh, fluorinated molecules, they are kind of forever chemicals. They are also in a lot of things, although you would never really know about it unless you're studying it. Um, and the, the problem is they're forever chemicals, but they're also incredibly pollutive. There's there been implications on their harm to human health. They get into our water systems, and there's really nothing we can do because they're so tiny and they're, they're just yeah, pretty much everywhere. So what this project is doing is trying to, one, produce them in a more sustainable way, so much cleaner using bioprocess uh, and yeah, those sustainable building blocks that I mentioned, but also make that those molecules biodegradable as well, so they don't last and linger in the environment forever. <clears throat> So we are supported by a growing, engaged, and incentivized community. This is just a tiny, tiny snapshot uh, of, of some of the amazing people in our community. As you can see, this sticker collection here, all these lovely logos, uh, just show you the power of the, the DAO model and the, the community model, because our surface area is, is insane. It's, it's really, really huge. And each of these individual organizations is doing awesome stuff. So um, I think, is iGem on there? Yeah, iGem is on there. For example, iGem is one of the biggest synthetic biology communities, and we have many, many uh, like crossovers with them as well. So what's next? What's on our roadmap? Um, like right now, we are focusing on continuing to fund that research, tokenize that, and bring uh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to tokenize that research and we want to also form spin outs as well. Um, number two is that we're going to pull knowledge and build our resources, uh, or build knowledge resources to support the translation process. So, as we heard from earlier, a lot of the problem is that academics and the people that are empowered to make these changes just don't really know what they're supposed to do. They don't know who they're supposed to go to um, and they don't know how they're supposed to be thinking about their research if they're they're wanting to maximize their impact. And then the third and final thing is that we are developing and launching our own token power collaboration platform, uh, which is called Flow. So you heard this morning about you know, 
the, the lack of incentive and the problems with collaboration in research. Well, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more in, in a little bit more detail is, yeah, how we are thinking about being able to empower people to change that, change that thing. So before I do that, I have to break a couple of assumptions or like, challenge a few um, challenge a few assumptions that we have in the, the kind of DSI community. So the first one is a community is not a DAO. So the fact that we have, for example, like 17, 1800 people on Discord does not mean that our DAO is 17 or 1800 people big. Um, and yeah, that's a harsh reality. The reality is that maybe 5%, if we're lucky, of those people are actively contributing to the efforts of the DAO itself. And for a while we were like, okay, well, that's a problem, we want to scale that. But I think now we're thinking very differently about it. Why do we want to scale that? And when we tried to scale that, we realized that it's actually not something that needs scaling or should necessarily be scaled, at least to the extent of we want a lean organization that's able to move quickly and find opportunities and make decisions and execute on things. We don't need hundreds of thousands of people involved in that process and actually they just slow the whole thing down. But what we do need uh, and what the community has, uh, the, the benefits of the community are kind of outlined here. So these are kind of different things. Uh, if we're separating value community and value down, these are some of the different things that each of these stakeholders should kind of focus on. And so I've segregated them here. On the community side, sorry, on the DAO side, we are like we should be finding uh, projects and we should be translating them, and that's a very hands-on, intensive process. It requires highly skilled and trained experts, people that are very networked, they have experience in the industry. We of course need people to evaluate those projects. Again, that's a limited number of people that have the expertise and ability to evaluate those projects. Of course, contributing to one of the working groups, of which we have five different at the moment, um, and then ultimately funding the research. So once we've made all those decisions, we should fund the research. But there was, I think in the early days, there was a hundred thousand things that we could possibly do, and we got very distracted and, and thought, we're gonna do everything. But actually, yeah, this is our core focus, and this is how we should remain. Valley Dow should be focusing on those things, but we need to build that interface with the community. And these are some of the things that the community itself has value and can give value to each other for. Um, we shouldn't stand in the way of that. We just need to build the platform that enables them to do so. So that's kind of where we're looking at with Flow. And why is this a problem? Uh, and why have we gone to this like extent of separating these two things out? Well, because if, <laughs> yeah, slight news flash to, to, to the VCs and, and, and governments, you can't just throw money at a broken system and expect it to be fixed. Um, and we can't do that in DSI either. So sure, we're finding projects, we're evaluating them, we're funding them, but we are playing the same game as everybody else. So if we really want to unlock this flywheel effect, we need to fix that broken link. We need to do something about it so that it is flowing, the wheels are turning more efficiently. So the second uh, kind of assumption that I wanted to challenge is the community is also not a product. I think in the Web3 space, we often and, and, and in some of the different verticals, I think maybe that is true. The community can be a product. They're people that are consumers, they're buying, actively buying products, they're engaging with your content. But in DSI, it's different, right? Like consumers, there is no consumer market for research or science, at least, um, until we get to the stage of having products. So we shouldn't be thinking about our community as a product. But what we do know is that the community needs products. So people that join our community, they come, they're activated, they're excited about getting involved in our mission. Um, but why are they coming to us? Because, because the system is broken, because they're fed up, because they want a new way to try things. And they need solutions actively to their problems. Of course, the biggest problem, when you ask any scientist, is funding. But it's not about just having more funding, it's, it's about being able to utilize that funding more effectively to justify it as well. So as I said, if we can fix this broken link, then we can get this flywheel moving again. And that's kind of what Flow is looking to do. So we interviewed over 50 researchers, 100% of them, and this is no lie, 100% of them said collaboration is important to achieving successful outcomes in their research. Two thirds of those said that it's crucial. So in other words, they could not survive without it. 
But as we've had this morning, there are many, many problems with collaboration. And so these are some of the problems, the like smaller problems that we identified in that process. One is assembling a team, or just how do we trust each other as scientists, especially when we're, we might be separated by geography, by institution, um, by cultural background even. Um, and then of course sharing uh, knowledge and data. Everyone's kind of very protective of over that stuff in science, but we shouldn't be, right? Like if we want to maximize the impact of everything we do, we should be sharing everything. We should be opening everything up. Um, managing a team, so the actual logistics and process of how do you manage people, how do you keep them engaged, incentivized and activated, and then of course accessing capital to fund that research and make it all happen. So flow is what we like to call the future of collaborative innovation. Um, and this simplified diagram shows you how easy it should be to change the world, right? Like if, you're, if you've decided and you woke up one and you're like, hey, I want to do something good for the world. It should be that easy, but it's not. <laughs> so what we're really trying to do is make it that easy so that a scientist, when they're working on something, they know exactly at the moment when they decide, yeah, hey, this, this could really help someone. They know exactly where to go. They know where to find funding. They know where to find support. And it becomes this easy, linear process to translating the research. So when you look at our community, um, as I said, many, many people in our community Huge variety of different backgrounds, um, but a community in and of itself isn't super useful. So we talk about the utility of our community and how we have, what well, one, the surface area to find those interesting research projects, but also that we have the opportunities to offer people. Um, but right now, it looks like this diagram, right? It's all spread out, it's happening in every direction. It's very hard when you come into the community to see it as like, oh, this is how I'm going to harness this, this is how I'm going to leverage this. Um, and that's kind of one of the problems with community uh, in the raw sense. So what we need to do in DSI and, and, and what I'm really passionate about is trying to weave all these components together in a more rational way so that we can, if we return to the previous slide, we can make that process as simple as, uh, as it should be. So what is the roadmap from, uh, again, oversimplification, but it should be, it should be kind of this easy. Uh, but this is the kind of roadmap for um, like a translational research project. So you've, you have a problem, you come up with a proof of concept, uh, you test that out, obviously then you form a business model, you form a team, you scale that, and if you are selling a product to customers, then of course you're, fi um, you're finding those first customers no, to make it happen. Um, but if we look at that process and we take all of those kind of people, stakeholders from our community, um, we can start to weave them into this process um, and make those introductions at the right, at the right moment. So what we want to create is a system where a project comes in and they can track their own progress and all of these different opportunities open up to them as they go through this process. So say I'm at TRL2, I'm only going to see things that are relevant to me at TRL2. And because there's so much information out there, like you should only be focusing on those things and then that's going to help you get to the next stage, the next stage, the next stage. So what we want to do is give people access to this hugely vast network of opportunities, whether it's funding or translation or support, um, but also products, services, legal advice, etc. Um, but in a way where they, yeah, they can come in and do it in a very simple, simple manner. Um, so yeah, these are kind of the three pillars of flow as we as we believe are important. So one is shared knowledge. Um, and then the other is transparency and trust, and those leading to meaningful collaborations. Those meaningful collaborations ultimately resulting in people changing the world and creating the impact. Um, so we are in the kind of like uh, beta building phase of this at the moment. So if you are a scientist, if you're interested in DSI, if you're interested in this translation problem, as we might call it, um, then please come and get in touch with us. Uh, either online or come speak to me in person because this is something we are really passionate about and are actively trying to solve. So right now the V0 version is going to focus on providing a fundraising database uh, because yeah, that is the biggest problem for people at the moment. Fundraising database where researchers can come in, upload their projects uh, and see all of the different available opportunities but then filter those based on their specific research project so that they're not looking at 100,000 different potential applications, they see the three that they're most likely to achieve a successful outcome with. Um, 
so yeah, that's uh, version zero of Flow. Um, I believe this QR code might be a little bit broken. Um, so feel free to try it out. If it doesn't work, our website is super easy. It's valleydow.bio. So just type that into your phone and you can find all of the information that you need to learn more about what we do and potentially get involved if you're interested. Um, so not sure how I'm doing on time, but if there is time, I will happily take some questions. in the community about biosecurity, that what happens if, you know, I engineer again in the backyard some novel virus and just get the printer and, and go somewhere, and how, what are the mechanisms and the actual tools that you will integrate to your workflow that you prevent, like, you know, malicious activities? Yeah, so, I mean, there are much, much smarter people working on this problem than, than I, um, so I won't pretend to have all of the answers. But I can give you an outline of the way, the different lines of thinking that there are on this particular problem. So on one side you have the kind of like, hands off, let's trust everybody um, and see what happens. Um, honestly, I haven't made up my mind about which, which of these groups I sit in yet, because on the one side, if you, like, any technology is dangerous in the wrong hands, right? So at what point does that, like, does that fear start to inhibit what we do? And in a lot of systems and policies, like that fear translates into policy, which then stifles the innovation itself. So should we let that go as far as impacting what we do, or should we just be closely monitoring things um, so that if something does go out of line, that we can respond to it quickly? And I, I think maybe that's where I'm more leaning towards is like monitoring, but not actively, let's say, enforcing until the point of there is a breach and there is something that we need to, to be concerned about. The other problem is, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, First, the other side is like having these rigorous rules and implementations. So we do kind of have this already, depending on certain software or platforms you use. If I want to order, uh, let's say, a COVID-19 gene, for example, there's a bunch of paperwork I have to fill out. I have to get approval. Like, you can't just go and buy something that's dangerous. Um, you have to really justify why you're using it and show the measures that you're taking to, to mitigate those risks. Um, but yeah, like that's a, it, it's really hard, right? So biology and science, like this physical work is not, it's not software. You can't monitor it in the same way, like you can't surveil it in the same way that you can surveil people on the internet. And so like as soon as somebody set, steps outside that system, maybe it's like all labs are unified and they're all monitoring and reporting stuff, but as soon as somebody steps out outside of that lab, do you know what they're gonna do? Do you know what they have in their pocket? Like, and how far does the surveillance go, right? So I think it's a problem that we kind of have to be aware of. We have to take measures to respond to it, but we can't ultimately stop it because it's technology and if somebody wants to harm people, then you know, how can we stop them? Right? Uh, if there are a problem. How does the end game look like? <laughs> the end game. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think the. I, I, I'm an optimistic person, so I like to think that we will um, we will sort our sort our shit out for for one of a better phrase. Um, and I think this technology really like shows you, as I said earlier, like it shows people the power of this whole. Uh, it, it's, it's a mindset shift, really. Like, we don't see waste as waste anymore. We see waste as opportunity. And this is how nature views everything, right? Like, I die and I get buried in the woods. Like, nature doesn't go, ugh, like, gross. It uses my body and it uses those like, compounds to make something new and, and continue this, like, circular process of life. And I think, again, coming back to what I said earlier about us 
fear in nature. Um, I think one of the other broken things that we've done is we've tried to disrupt this circular process. We've tried to stop water flowing, or we've tried to stop energy going into certain parts of the, uh, like the biological system. And of course there's gonna be imbalances. Of course we're gonna have now like a disbalance of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so I think like more fundamentally, other than the science, other than the translation of support, and all of the awesome things that we're doing in DSI, like there has to be a mindset shift and, and starting to see the world as a system that we are a part of um, and that we should participate in, but also consider the connectivity of everything. Like everything should be recycled, reused, and like, ultimately feed this sustainable system. Because if we want something to be sustainable, we can't have leaks, right? We, 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 everything needs to be contained and, and, and wrapped up in that system. So, yeah, I think that's where I see the end game, um, but it's going to take us a lot of work to get there. Do you have like a batch? Can I ask another one? Because, um, yeah, how does that look like for, for Valley What does the end game look for Valley Dow to achieve? Yeah, so I, I think, like, I think Valley Down, and yeah, if we go back to the separation, I think Valley Down will continue funding research and doing, and doing awesome stuff. Um, but I think we need to move like slightly, like expand on that within DSI and say like, well, what else can we do to actually fix this system? So I think, um, of course, flow is, is one movement towards that. But what we want to build is an ecosystem where like everybody can just keep doing the awesome stuff that they're doing but it's all harmonised, it's all synchronised. If they've agreed that, hey, yeah, we're working on stuff, but we also care about climate change, then they should be able to just like plug into this ecosystem and see what are the one or two or three things that I can do that are actually going to move um, move the needle. And I think if we can capitalise on all of those like micro movements, um, then we design like a, a machine that is actually really, really effective at, at what it's supposed to do, which is how science should be, uh, but sadly is not. So, yeah, I think that connectivity and, and harmony and alignment in everything that we do is is important, and I think this is why Web three has has such a like, important role in that because it's about bringing people together and empowering them to make collective action towards something they care deeply about. All right, thank you, man. So, as a speaker, really, I'm asked to uh, play soon. But uh, if anyone is, anyone would like some refreshments, light lunch is there, so you can take. William will talk a little bit about permission in science and data permission in biology. But uh, free feel to mingle uh, after this talk and meet, and we will join back after this talk at uh, 1:25. Here it is. 
This cell is the most copied cell in biology. 1951, patient Henrietta Lacks presents to John Hopkins University. After childbirth, she complains about pain in the uterus, and they do a biopsy, and they find cervical cancer. This cell was sent around to different laboratories to research and to see how they could help her and understand what was going on. Now, I have to tell you two things about science in 1951 in John Hopkins University. Number one, black people were given treatment for free, and the treatment was experimental. Number two, nobody asked before taking biopsies, and she was entirely not informed about this, nor did she consent to the reuse of this cell. There's a lot of reuse. Here she is. And this woman has contributed more to science than she could ever know and will ever know. Um, outcome, personally, wasn't the best for her, but from her family, we will, we will see. There's, a, there's a, some sunshine here. This cell is very special. Well, the cell is very special because as they pass it around to different laboratories, normally when you take a cancer cell, these things are moving pretty quickly. And they don't have a long lifetime. They can last a couple hours, a couple days. You pass it around quickly so you can do your research. There's telomeres at the end of the cell, and they divide, and they cut off, and they cell dies. Whatever this process. However, this one cell didn't. For some reason, the, 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 the telomeres at the end don't cut off when the cell divides, and it is the world's first immortal cell that we've documented. The cell is immortal, and it divides perfectly. So, this cell has been used in all kinds of fields of research, and not just bikini science, actual other types of things. Polio research was directly from this. HIV, the way that cells divide, they have a replicable cell that can be used in all different types of biology, and they can repeat the science over decades. We're still using this cell. This cell has been sold for billions of dollars of retail, and still is sold today. The family found out decades later that this was happening and used without their consent, and today this would not happen. The pharma that is using this cell and selling this cell have said we will not do this again, but just this one time we're going to keep selling this cell. So the cell they have, ethically this is a disaster, and the family says, well what, we would like to be involved in the heritage of our, our mom, grandma, great grandma, Henrietta. And so what we've come up with is this family is part of a committee. And they vote. Now, if you were the family, what would you care about? Would you care about some of the billions of dollars that are coming in? What, what things would you care about? This family, they care about deciding which research projects get to use the cell. That is the thing they care about. And they vote on it over generations. And the way they would join this, this committee is by being related, because they share the cells, right? So, is this the first data dump. I think it is. Yeah. And so these descendants are continuing to sue the laboratories, and they are settling or winning, and they are having good participation in these, in these in, um, inside of these the studies to decide what's going to happen. The ethics committees have been studying this for decades. What do we do with this? Because the, nobody wants to stop using this stuff. And everybody wants to do the right thing. So, let's formalize this. Let's find ways that we can take this great story and everybody who wants to do the right thing here as a Kickstarter for the projects that we want to do with NFTs, with data permission, and we need to prove that these people want to participate in these studies, and we want to do it decentralized, we want to allow everybody to know about these permissions, and we want to do the right thing here. And we can decide if these projects will be allowed to use the cells, if they can be sub-licensed, all these business decisions, you can at least ask these people, hey, are you cool with this or not? So, why do we benefit from this? The scientists benefit because also they can learn more things from the family members because they will continue to provide extra um, contemporaneous information and data for their medical presentations over history and their descendants, right? So it just makes the data better when we can learn 
We can't learn much from Henry, Henrietta. We've got to, she's done her part. But that the family can continue. And this does not happen over typical biology studies. You only get one patient, maybe a descendant. But now we're getting generational cont contribution into these projects. I'll share a project I've worked on. And this is, uh, this is a DNA collection project for a pharma company that was looking to find diverse DNA. If you're European, if you're white, uh, they've got enough DNA for you for the projects they're working on. And so they're looking for any other type of DNA and health outcomes. And in Mexico, luckily, there's a lot of indigenous populations that have very different DNA. This is the project I was working on, and so I'll share it. So this project, in the United States, when you collect DNA, you must ask for people's names. This is a ridiculous policy. And so what we did in Mexico, which has similar policies, is we pre-filled the form with John Doe as the default name, and uh, nobody changed it. So I think we've gotten around that one. <laughs> and then we have this box here. It's a very normal DNA collection box. Uh, you've seen these kids before if you've ever done a test. And then your identity and registration is done through this card here, which has 12 words on it. And we have successfully deployed this in Mexico with indigenous populations working with elders and tribes to garner support for these type of projects. And we include them in it to see if they want to join the project, why is the project doing these things. These are the type of questions you typically don't ask in a research study. But they are forever connected, unless they forget these 12 words, which they should share with people, their family members that they trust. And that's the start. So this is the start of the project. Um, we've looked at other things. We've looked at a molecule. Uh, this, is, this is my slides from DSI uh, NYC last year. So we were, this might be an old screenshot, but we're looking at that. They're, they're financializing it. And this is kind of maybe a more business way. Personally, I'm a little scared of the way the finance works because I've gone through the NFT and ICOs, and I know that bad things can happen when you financialize things. So I'm, I want to watch that, but I think they've got the right direction. So I'm glad to see that this is connected, but I wanted to give you like an N equals one study here. They've got the liquidity. Um, they've got, I think that's, I think that they do see So the ethics here. Biotech, always involves ethics. And not always just when it goes wrong in the lab in Wuhan that the US actually funded. Uh, it actually comes from all different directions of biology. And the things that we're doing are gonna become more dangerous. They're gonna be affecting more people and we're doing DNA stuff. Religious interests are gonna be affected. The, this eth the ethics is much, much larger for the future. So it helps us to get to better ethical decisions with more stakeholders. That includes the participants, the funders, everybody, all the community, the people that are interested, the people from the 1950s who are contributing data, what were they thinking, because it wasn't possible, what we're doing now, when they started the data collection. We can include all these people, but we can also include privacy. We can also include, we can include the people, but, in, but uh, allow their privacy. So I think NFTs is an interesting use case for this, uh, just sharing the one thing we've done. And then also, regarding DAOs, so we heard this before, um, Mark, Marcus? Mark. Uh, you talked about, um, there, were two, there were two use cases here where we talked about DAOs and how many people participate. Voting in a DAO is not always the best outcome. We've tried DAOs, we're using this word from Web3, from voting on tokens, that we're usually with the goal of making money. We've used DAOs or L1 blockchain networks, where you want to delegate people to stake. They're completely different use cases. So I just want to say that DAOs and using votes that are kind of one-to-one -one might not be the best mechanism to make decisions for these type of projects. However, it's a nice first-order approximation. So we can get these people in, hopefully more than 50 people, and just be careful before we put that type of thing into stone. And so, so there's my presentation on uh, my experience with data DAOs. Thank you. But one more thing. <laughs> I didn't want to leave you empty-headed. So I did start a little project here. And this is for more commercial, if you're working in science in your day job. This is a little template 
for how you can implement a blockchain-y thing on simple life. So this works in very basic commercial labs and other applications where you do research work. You're not going to convince them to do a blockchain. You're not going to convince them to take money from Molecule. But just some of your internal records keeping, you can have permanent immutable records with attestations, and you can just try this little experiment internally. Very simple uh, toy project, but I'd like to take these ideas into the science that we're doing. Thank you. So, um, lucky to help. We worked with Bustamante Lab, which is in uh, Miami, previously from Stanford, and we implemented this with the first phase of this project with the government of Quintana Roo in Mexico, and it was during COVID. So this, this is not gonna happen again. <laughs> but uh, the, the implementation we started with is uh, the tourism industry had a big problem. There's a big outbreak in Mexico, nobody wanted to travel there, and they needed tourists. So, uh, they needed to do lots of testing to prove that the people here didn't have COVID. And they wanted to do it very loud. They wanted all the newspapers to pick up the fact that they're testing people and they're not having COVID. So, they used NFTs. The news all covered it that they are using NFT and new tech that people from Miami to do COVID testing. However, slide can be used for two purposes. COVID testing and DNA. So these people, they had convinced them that they could, and it was in the airport. You could not get on the plane without this test. So we had the kiosk, we had the government approval, and there was a checkbox. And then many people just clicked the checkbox, they picked this dumb little card that they didn't understand, they put it in their pocket, they took it home, and uh, some of them will be not caring about this, and some will be. How do we actually disintermediate uh, 23 and for example? I mean, I'm, I'm really curious about my, you know, my, where I'm coming from and all that and the genealogy, but uh, I won't do it, I won't give up my DNA, so I'm just waiting for a commercial version of it that potentially preserves my data. Well, long term, we should not do any of that, and we should not even, you shouldn't even use this long term. You should buy a DNA sequencer, and you should share it with your friends. We're actually getting a lot cheaper. But this is commercially available in the, under Somos Americas. Uh, this is the white label version, but the version that in its uh, box here is actually commercially available. And specifically, this is called Somos. This, the data the collection and the, that they're doing is targeted towards uh, Latin America. Because if you've done 23andMe, you get this pie chart that's like Latin, 50%. It's like, oh, thanks. These people try to break that down a little better, and they get, they get more data from this. To be honest, even doing this anonymously for DNA is not possible. Even if you fill in John Doe and your name is John Doe and you don't cross it out to put your real name in, you're not anonymous. My parents or my family members have done it, so I'm in there without my consent. And I'm a huge data privacy advocate. That's how I got into blockchain and all these things, and it will fail. So this entire industry is doomed for privacy and DNA. But luckily, the, the sequences are very cheap. I mean, we're talking down. It used to be hundreds of thousands for a sequence, now we're sub thousand dollars. So the, the numbers are approachable. Thanks. You have to stand if you want.
Bom, nossa, tô com uma luz horrível nas costas, né? Eu vou ali. Não, eu vou aqui, ó. Do lado, ó. Bom, não sei quem que tá assistindo aí ainda, <risos> mas estamos aqui. O evento tá, no, é, tá acontecendo no mesmo prédio onde foi o, o evento de ontem. A gente só tá aqui na região, no, nos fundos, né? E o evento, bom, para quem chegou depois, o evento é de Desai. Ó, oh, o Gabriel tá a caminho. O evento vai só até as três, viu, Gabriel? Então, você tá vendo... A gente acabou, inclusive, de almoçar. O pessoal liberou um almoço aqui. E vou dar uma volta ali pro, pro outro lado. Com vocês. Então, o evento tá, tá acontecendo. A galera tá toda comendo agora. E a parte tensa é que eu achei um cantinho ali pra colocar a câmera bem de frente com, com, com a tela. Mas, cara, sempre tem um infeliz pra parar exatamente na frente. O cara vai e para e estaciona na frente, não tem a mínima noção. Um absurdo. Bom, aqui é aqui é aquela sala ontem onde onde estava rolando algumas palestras. É a mesma sala, só que a gente entrou pelo outro lado e aqui já está tudo vazio, né? Eles fecharam o acesso para lá. Está rolando outro evento lá daquele lado. E aqui é onde a galera estava tomando café. Ah! Aqui é onde tinha o, o a bebida, o board de banana. Que a gente tava aqui, a maquineta do board de banana. Deixa eu ver. Não, eu quero com zoom, isso. Beleza. Então, eu cheguei, eu não cheguei exatamente no começo, eu perdi o comecinho do evento. Tava com a Miriam, a gente antes de sair de casa teve que resolver umas coisinhas antes de sair. Não deu pra sair de cara e vir pra cá. Aí a gente chegou, é, liguei o, a câmera e comecei a assistir. Muito bom, teve uns insights assim que sem brincadeira. Teve uns insights muito bacanas. É, eu acho que pra compartilhar assim, tem um que eu achei fantástico. E eu quero pensar numa forma, de repente fazer isso com, a própria, com, a, com o próprio bloco. E fazer renascer a dar o do bloco de novo, né? Que tá super parada e tal. Seria o seguinte, o pessoal, é justamente para dar mais poder e mais controle sobre o programa para a galera do bloco. Então eu vi um, uns projetos aqui, principalmente o pessoal da Vita Dal, onde eles estão é, descentralizando a, a propriedade intelectual do, do, das pesquisas científicas, que esse é o principal problema, né? A galera ou não quer compartilhar, ou se compartilhar tem problema com a distribuição ou a retenção da propriedade intelectual da pesquisa científica. E esse é um problema, pô, mega sério, né? Então o que, que eles estão fazendo? Eles estão fazendo um NFT da propriedade intelectual, então a propriedade intelectual é tokenizada num NFT... Beleza. E aí eles fracionam esse, esse NFT para que as pessoas que adquirirem partes desse NFT vão ter direito à propriedade intelectual. Então a distribuição de royalties, essas coisas todas, ela fica fácil de distribuir, inclusive para anônimos. Porque eles são donos dessa propriedade intelectual. Quem tiver, é, é a porcentagem. Quem tiver mais, tiver menos, tal, vai ter a participação em cima da propriedade intelectual daquele projeto, então é uma, uma maneira que eles estão achando, inclusive de fundiar os projetos através da DAO, né? então o cara, é, a DAO, além de participar da tomada de decisões para os caminhos, para dire o direcionamento do projeto, a galera ainda tem legalmente uma participação em cima da propriedade intelectual produzida pelo projeto, Cara, isso, na boa, isso é, é na minha cabeça é mind-blowing. É mais legal o fracionamento do que o fracionamento que o pessoal estava fazendo para real estate, para para outra, aqui, fracionando, no caso, um, um apartamento, um terreno e tal. E aqui os caras estão trabalhando no fracionamento do, do IP, justamente para conseguir mais participantes e pessoas ajudando no funding e no apoio desses projetos. De acordo com o pessoal do Vitadal, 
o voto de comunidade, ele não, começa, ele não acontece no início, ele acontece ao final. Por quê? Porque eles precisam garantir que projetos sejam escolhidos por especialistas. E a gente sabe que muitas vezes a comunidade não tem é, especialistas. E não é a comunidade toda que participa da DAO. Então eles trabalham com é, indústria, VCs, experts da, do meio. Eles vão fazer as primeiras triagens. E depois que a indústria tudo foi tudo avalizado, aí vai para voto da comunidade para determinar... Uh, para onde os fundos que a DAO detém, para onde que os fundos vão no final das contas. Né? E aí, é, de acordo com os projetos que são feitos, o IP ele é tokenizado, fracionado, entre os participantes da DAO, que vão ter um token referente àquele IP específico, aquela propriedade intelectual específica, e poder receber royalties sobre a... a, a o uso, a venda, a comercialização, tudo que é feito em relação àquela propriedade intelectual. Cara, sem brincadeira, isso eu achei fantástico. O Elber falou aí, né? Olha o NFT fracionado sendo usado de maneira correta. Exatamente. Não é fracionar a imagem do Doge, saca? Não é, é vou, vou fracionar aqui um, um NFT de imagem, um macaco entediado, alguma coisa assim que nem fizeram com o NFT do Doge, que foi um NFT fracionado. Mas o uso do NFT fracionado, no caso da propriedade intelectual, faz muito sentido. Faz muito sentido. Principalmente quando a gente fala de pesquisa científica, que é tão difícil de conseguir é, investimento. E esses caras, eles estão, é, de acordo com, com as estatísticas que a menina é, colocou, eles estão conseguindo reduzir tempo de, é, de funding de um projeto científico que antes era de 3 a 6 meses, eles estão colocando até 90 dias. Até novembro. Cara, é um absurdo. 90, se para pensar, 90 dias é muito rápido o processo, porque ele passa pelos especialistas, passa é, pela indústria, aí vai para a comunidade, vota, desce o funding, e funding pequeno, tipo de 50 mil a 250 mil dólares, que é o suficiente para dar start no projeto. É esse projeto, ele inicia, recebe esse funding, que não é um funding grande, mas é um funding principalmente no... É tipo um pre-seed, é um momento super inicial do projeto. Se der certo, aquilo spin-offa, a propriedade intelectual é, é tokenizada, e fracionada entre os membros daquilo que, vai, que, daquilo que dá certo. Porra, mano, eu achei demais. Achei demais o projeto, assim, e eu não sabia a fundo como isso estava sendo feito, e é coisa para a gente pensar como que a gente consegue fazer a, a DAO funcionar direito como deveria ser, né? Não para a galera ficar, é só, ah, é só token para votar, ou é só token, é, sei lá, para a galera especular. Ao invés disso, a pessoa poder se sentir parte de maneira efetiva daquilo que a gente está construindo com a comunidade e pô, poder participar e falar, cara, eu sou, eu sou mais dono disso aqui. Por que, que eu sou dono? Porque tá aqui, ó. Eu sou mais dono disso aqui, saca? Eu acho que isso... Cara, tem, tem alguma coisa aí que eu vou pensar um pouco, mas... Me parece que esse uso com NFT fracionado de IP, porra, minha cabeça explodiu assim, fez toda a diferença para mim, né? É, eu não tinha visto outros casos de uso e esse caso de uso assim, ele foi, foi muito bom. Não, o... <risos> Obrigado por ter salvado amanhã porque eu acordei atrasado. Pois é, pois é. Hey Will. Ah, então é isso, eu acho que, pô, mano, vamos ver o quanto vai, vai durar minha bateria ainda aqui, que já tá quase indo, agora o pessoal parou para um almoço, então eles estão fazendo um intervalo, e na verdade eu comi enquanto tava na palestra do Will, né, tava, a Miriam foi lá pegar um, os, os almoços lá, a gente comeu antes, então a galera tá toda almoçando agora, eles vão voltar... Umi 25, se eu pouco me engano. 
Nossa, tem tempo ainda, viu? Pera aí. Nossa, é 1h09 agora. A galera vai voltar 1h25. Então daqui 15 minutinhos. É coisa eu deixo a câmera ali só. Né? Fazer aquela, aquele momento intervalo. Deixo a câmera funcionando ali. Mas eu vou até onde der a bateria. Eu vou até onde der a bateria. E meus créditos de internet, né? Óbvio. Não só bateria. Não, mas a internet também que, que aí vai, né? Mas, cara, eu tô, tô feliz, assim, ter visto um pouquinho desse evento de, de, de sai assim. E os outros projetos de... Algumas, algumas coisas que estão trabalhando. É um projeto super iniciante. É pra... Eu, eu gostei da definição que eles deram, né? É, foi o seguinte. Eles estão trabalhando no, em estudos científicos voltados para a mulher. E aí, eles trouxeram a seguinte definição... Pra, principalmente para não causar esse impacto, porque a gente sabe que a sociedade ela tá toda maluca entre ah, é mulher, não é mulher, é homem, não sei o que. Sempre se falam mulheres reprodutor, que reproduzem ou não. É isso. Por que, que eles falam isso? Porque tem que, eles falam que tem que desmistificar o fato de toda a sociedade achar que é mulher só onde o biquíni cobre. Saca? E que a mulher é muito, é, biologicamente, é muito mais que isso. Mas que a maior parte da sociedade acha que mulher é só onde o biquíni cobre. Então, é, ele, é, é no sentido de que muitas mulheres aparecem ou, ou nascem com desvios ou com mudanças gené na sua genética que continuam sendo mulheres, mas pelo fato de elas não reproduzirem, não significa que não são mulheres mas são mulheres que teve, tem algum tipo de é, mudança né, biológica no corpo. Então eles separa, separam de maneira muito simples mulheres que reproduzem e mulheres que não reproduzem. E aí eles conseguem englobar, é, sem trazer nenhum viés político ideológico, mas para a ciência, todo o grupo de mulheres é, existente no planeta é, seja é, tendo né, a, na totalidade o seu sistema reprodutivo ou não, saca? Feminino. E tentando desmistificar o lance de que mulher é só é, é um mini-homem, que nem ela disse. Então, o pessoal acha que mulher é um mini-homem biologicamente, que é só é mulher onde o, bi, porque, onde o biquíni cobre. Né? É, eu achei muito legal isso, porque ela falou o seguinte... É, até, por exemplo, em 1993, nos Estados Unidos, foi quando surgiu uma lei que permitia que mulheres participassem de trials clínicos. Era proibido. Era proibido. Inclusive, diversos medicamentos que só foram testados em homens por conta disso, é, quando usado por mulher tinha vários problemas, porque não batia a biologia. Né? A dosagem era tudo diferente. A dosagem, a... A, a, a aplicação do remédio, eu não sei, na posologia, né, essas coisas todas, é, para a mulher é totalmente diferente e isso era desconsiderado. Então, achei muito legal a abordagem científica que está sendo dada é, para falar de todo o, todo o escopo de mulheres, mesmo as que não podem se reproduzir pelas vias normais como, como mulher, não se reproduzem como mulheres. Né? sem é descartando não é sem é descartando a possibilidade dos malucos aí simplesmente é, trazer aquela narrativa de ideologia aquela coisa bem imbecilizada que tem sido feita no mercado de é, ideologizar e discriminar né discriminar mesmo uh, a, a mulher porque ela nasceu diferente então eu acho que traz um o, a ciência de novo a ciência consegue contornar e, e mostrar que é possível você tratar um tema tão sensível que é um tema de saúde sem a, a, é, descartando a possibilidade do, dessa sociedade imbecilizada trazer questão ideológica seus preconceitos e suas discriminações para o tema né? a ciência ela não, não deveria 
não deveria uh, conter esse tipo de coisa. Achei muito legal. Então, e, e isso porque tem diversas pesquisas, ela estava levantando umas estatísticas, tem diversas pesquisas que são feitas, voltadas para a biologia da mulher, mas que elas estão engavetadas porque elas acabam não, elas não conseguem tracionar a pesquisa, não conseguem funding, né? Então ela está querendo é, desengavetar essas pesquisas científicas e trazê-las para as pautas e, e trazer, trazer a pesquisa e conseguir funding para que essas pesquisas aconteçam. Eu achei, achei muito legal assim, o projeto de... Né? A mulher é mais um ser humano, e sim, as pesquisas específicas da biologia feminina não tá, da mulher não estão acontecendo por motivos X, então se ela está trabalhando para tentar achar um meio de que essas pesquisas aconteçam efetivamente porque biologicamente somos seres diferentes, então acho muito válido, achei muito legal isso também, né? Então tem bastante coisa interessante sendo discutida aqui. Eu achei, pô, eu achei demais. Achei bem legal. E aí o chat, eu tô respondendo o chat pelo celular da Miriam. Né? Então eu tô... É, o celular, só que tá logado na kick dela, né? Porque eu não tô... Eu, eu devia ter trazido aquele outro celular que tá sem bateria e ligado ele no carregador, no, direto no, na bateria para ficar respondendo só o chat, usar ele de segunda tela, porque o meu celular aqui não dá, eu não, consigo, não tenho como responder, né? Tá gravando? Então, foi uma falha, já aprendo para a próxima, né? Ontem eu fiquei falando com o chat o tempo todo, então eu não senti falta disso. Mas aqui é uma sala só, porque é um side event do, do Banana Conf, então tá só com uma sala disponível e mó silêncio. A galera, tipo, não tem tanta gente, estamos falando de ciência, né, não tem tanta gente, é um tema sério, não tem, é, não tem tokenização para ah, ficar fazendo especulação, o pessoal tá levando bastante a sério, principalmente o ponto de construção de times descentralizados para prática, para prática de ciência, ciência científica, né, pesquisa e funding, que é o principal problema da, da ciência, né porque ela fica limitada ao escopo de, das grandes indústrias e o que elas querem é pesquisar. E aí fica tudo extremamente limitado. Então, o, o tema é bastante sério, tem pouca gente e aí eu não consigo, não tenho como falar. Estou dentro da sala, lá, tô colocando o celular no meio da sala, eu não tenho como trocar ideia no chat. Então, estou lá só no celular da Miriam, lá, escrevendo. E, mas vou continuar. Vou até voltar lá para dentro agora, vou, vou posicionar o celular lá de novo. E aí eu volto daqui a pouquinho. Dá para esperar mais um pouco, ó. 18, já vai dar mais 5 minutinhos. Aí eu faço uns 5 minutinhos de pausa. Deixa eu ver, eu tô com... É, minha bateria não vai durar, eu não consigo ver a porcentagem aqui da bateria. Eu só vejo o sinalzinho, ó, o desenho da bateria. Eu não consigo ver a porcentagem. Tô com 2 horas e 18 de live... Acho que tá ok, cara. Pô, durou até que bastante a live, né? Tá rolando, tá rolando. Interessante, cara. Eu, eu gostei. E fiquei pensando, inclusive, em coisas aqui pra fazer pro próprio canal. Do tipo, separar esses vídeos ou abrir um canal 2. Tipo, Ed Oz 2. E fazer um trabalho com os vídeos em inglês. E conteúdo em inglês nesse Ed Oz 2. Porque é uma coisa fato. E, e, esses vídeos em inglês. Eles. A maior parte do público não consegue consumir. Do, do, do público do Morning Crypto. Né? A maior parte não consegue consumir. Por, por, por falta do inglês mesmo. E o público que entende inglês. Acaba não, não entrando no canal. Porque a maior parte dos conteúdos são todos em português. Então o cara é bombardeado diariamente com um conteúdo que não interessa para ele, e ele acaba tirando as notificações. E aí o fato de tirar a notificação, acho que acaba prejudicando o, o canal em si. Então teve o vídeo de ontem, tem esse vídeo de hoje, das palestras. Eu, tô, eu fiquei pensando nisso agora, enquanto estava lá, justamente de de repente abrir um canal, é de os 2, 
alguma coisa assim. Colocar só conteúdo em inglês nele, porque eu tenho liberdade de produzir o conteúdo 100% em inglês. Falado em inglês, é, apresentado em inglês e fica lá no canal 2. Né? Porque eu posso cobrir mais eventos assim, sem o risco de ficar mixando muito. E aí eu mantenho 100% desse conteúdo em inglês. Né? Que aí vai... Puta, pode ser que funcione. Né? E as pessoas vão ter uma opção a mais de, de conteúdo, de canal, e assinar o canal específico que interessa para eles. Não... É, ficar mixando, né? Porque realmente a galera do BR não, não vai consumir esse conteúdo de DSI. E a galera gringa não vai assinar o meu canal ou se assinar, em questão de pouco tempo, vai tirar as notificações ou sair. E aí o churn pode ser horrível. Né? Ó, oh, o Afonso falou, gosto da ideia. Ó, oh, o Gabriel também curtiu. Eu acho que eu vou fazer isso e eu vou, vou pôr esses vídeos em inglês e começar a produzir mais conteúdo, ou o conteúdo que eu produzi em inglês, tudo, eu faço tudo para um canal separado. E fica de os mesmo, faz um de os dois lá, e aí eu vou postando. Porque, por exemplo, esse do, do evento aqui, eu posso cortar cada uma dessas palestras, acho que são três ou quatro palestras aí que eu marquei, e coloco essas palestras lá depois cortadinhas, aí fala o pessoal do evento, ó, esse conteúdo aqui e tal, ele tá disponível aqui nesse canal, e aí é um canal totalmente diferente. Vou, 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 vou trabalhar nisso. Vou trabalhar nisso no final de semana, que é só na separada. Cara, eu tô andando, escrita que meu relógio, ele simplesmente acionou a parte de exercício, eu só queria ver a hora, Quatro minutinhos. Como, como que é? A mesinha colocou ali. É de... Putz, ficou em cima o negócio. Que tem um botão na frente aqui. Eu não consigo ler. É de Ozen. É de Ozen. <risos> é de Ozen. É isso, ela tá escutando. Ela tá lá, tá lá assistindo, então. Tá lá, porque a Miriam tá lá na mesa, lá. Um dia a gente tava fazendo a transmissão lá. É de Ozen. Não, não. É de Ozen, é ficar zoado. Eu acho que vão... Vai ficar estranho. Vai ficar estranho. É melhor meter um É de Oz 2. Porque É de Ozen não, não vai dar certo isso aí, mano. Ah, ela tá, a Miriam tá lá cuidando, garantindo a mesa. <risos> Beleza, obrigado. Obrigado. Deixa eu ver aqui, então, é... Então é isso, vou voltar pra lá que já... Mimi, fala se tá começando aí, que aí eu já volto. Bem, 1h23, eles tinham falado voltar 1h25. Eu acredito que a galera toda já comeu. E o estoniano, ele é muito... Muito em cima da hora, assim. Nada ainda? Beleza. Então é isso, eu acho que eu vou separar os canais. Canal no YouTube. E o da Kik. Ou... Oh! Putz, aí eu posso fazer um negócio também, eu posso pegar e fazer direto na, no YouTube, né? Esse tipo de evento, porque eu não faço na Kik. Aí eu faço no YouTube, no Edios 2, e publico direto lá no canal 2, né? Aí eu só, só alterno aqui o, o... da onde eu vou publicar, e eu faço direto no YouTube. Não precisa ter um canal da Kik separado, eu não sei se eu vou fazer live... É em, em inglês, assim. Não sei se é esse o caminho. Hum, não sei. Não sei se é esse o caminho. Mas é, é a questão de experimentar. Fazer um experimento aí. Com conteúdo em inglês direto no YouTube. Eu acho que pode fazer sentido. Pode funcionar. Eu falo, acho que o YouTube pode atingir mais gente. Pois é. E aí faz direto no YouTube. Porque o vídeo já fica lá direto, né? Esse vídeo aqui, por exemplo, eu tô gravando no celular, eu tô, tô fazendo direto pra Kik, mas ao final, esse vídeo ele vai, vai ser... É, eu vou salvar no celular, e do celular eu vou subir. Olha os caras, mano, eu falo, os caras são muito... Ó, 1h24, já estão chamando a galera pra voltar. 
pra 1h25 começar. O estoniano é foda, mano. É diferente a parada. A parada em matéria de horário, assim. Já estão chamando, 1h24 já estão chamando. Então deixa eu voltar. Olha lá. Every right, everyone. See you soon. <risos> We are slowly turning to the second Olá. half of today and we will come in a little bit more technical talks but definitely very, very interesting aspects. What well, that happens in the university is the national decentralized engineering plan and then we will look a little bit here about IP and DAOs and we come in here again to higher side chats Vamos. and also Vamos voltar lá agora. Like Eu vou até desligar. Galera, tá difícil. Thank you for inviting me for this for this meeting, and I really enjoyed the the morning session. It's a little bit difficult to prepare a talk without talking about what we do in the lab. So I I try to pitch certain things, and I got some things right, and I will probably be a little bit off in some of the things. I wanted to share some of the notes I took up to now from the talks that have happened in the morning. So, for example, asterisk, a really cool project. Mas eu tô virando, ele tá travando, filha da mãe. I was wondering how long time it would take for the people to understand that the current research is wrongly named, that it omits them, and we have to use the name non-reproductive research, and why it would become as a normal research, and the other thing would become kind of a stigmatized. Taylor, yeah, I really liked the talk and I really liked the, the metaphors, but I don't agree that we went from centralized systems to decentralized systems. Actually, original internet, the, the, the founding fathers of internet, the engineers, they designed everything to be decentralized. So when you had your first web page on the first internet, you were running your own server, you were running your own uh, DNS server, your own mail server, you were basically doing everything. Microsoft was not there, the companies were not there, they were just a bunch of geeks having their web pages. Uh, it was really decentralized and it was really uh, kind of refreshing. Uh, and then the West Galera, fala aí para mim se está dando para escutar direitinho. Fala aí no chat se está dando para escutar. Uh, so the original uh, principles behind the internet are uh, what we trying to get back with, with Web3. Uh, and then I can also comment about biology to get to us. Uh, Australia is a country where um, everything out there is to get you, that's true. But the indigenous people, uh, they have a very close relationship with nature. They live in symbiosis with nature. And again, valeu, valeu. we sort of lost it. Uh, and I was, uh, as a kind of a side project, I was really interested in like, why, why it happened. And the actually uh, um, kind of a Greek hypothesis is that the monotheistic religions were the main source of us losing touch with nature uh, because they taught people to be separated from nature and control it and own it and you know, use it uh, whereas the monotheistic religions didn't have that and you can see that with the belief systems of indigenous people in, in many countries so this kind of a dichotomy with nature is kind of a symptom of western civilization really not kind of ingrained with humanity as such. So th those are kind of a small comments uh, I had. Uh, there was a, this um, th discussion on how can we deal with risks and with malicious use. I will talk a little bit about it in the, in, in the later in the talk. But there are basically two models. Um, so from one hand we can regulate it. And for example, finance industry went into regulation. And on the other hand, you can sort of uh, let people do whatever they want until they do harm and then you sue them and then you make them pay for the harm they made. Uh, and we kind of see that, for example, with entrepreneurship. 
So entrepreneurship is not regulated, but if you found something that makes harm, you can pursue them, then we will go back out and you will be eliminated, right? In finance, we went into regulation. And those two systems, they have uh, you know, positive and negative sides. And one negative side of regulation is that the stakeholders will comply, but they will obey the rules in such a narrow way that they will cheat just to comply with the rules but do harm. And then the law is hopeless because they comply but they still do harm. Um, so the second model where you don't regulate but let people do whatever and then you sue them tends to be more agile, more like more bureaucratizing things. Anyway, so let's let's go with this. Um, you can join on a mobile phone and you can sort of answer some trivia questions and then we'll see you know how it goes. All right. Two players, not a lot of crowd. All right. So here's the template. You will see some pictures in, in case the talk is boring. At least you will see some some nice salaries. Um, so how many countries are in the world? Yeah, it's not a tri trivial question actually because. In some jurisdictions, some countries are counted as countries and some countries are not. So depending like where you sit in different jurisdictions, the answer is actually not unique. Uh, so yes, around 200 countries, 196 if you count those problematic areas or 192 if you don't count them. So then, right. So we have, if we have 200 countries, we have 200 currencies, so how many cryptocurrencies do we have? So how many currencies per country do we really need? Mm -hmm. Currently, we like, historically, we have one, right? Each, and then in Europe, even not one, because less than one, because many countries share the same currency. So how many do we have? Yeah, we have over two and a half million right now. Uh, why? So, so we have on average 20,000 currencies per country. It's mind boggling if you think about it. Like, what, what happened? Like, what, why, why is that? So, the question is like, what are the currencies used for? Uh, and how we interact with each other? Uh, doing research, doing things. Um, and a lot of times we kind of interact with each other through transacting um, and it could be in terms of uh, monetary value uh, but it could be in terms of other value systems too so this ability for us to transact is what this kind of a new uh, uh, revolution sort of is it's democratizing people's way of interacting through digital means right? Right, one more. Oh, that's not, that should be here. All right, so uh, <laughs> that is from the template. Sorry. Uh, why am Why am here? I am a computer scientist, and throughout my life, uh, very interesting things happen. So when I started. And when you learn the programming language, you have to go to a big centralized company and you have to pay them to use the compiler. Because you couldn't compile the program you wrote because you don't have a compiler, you have to pay. Um, and then people were saying, yeah, that's the model there is. You know, you pay them everything, you kind of protect your IP, you, you, that's how innovation happens, that's how you monetize on your work. So as a programmer, you produce something you have to protect it, and then you have to sell it, right? That's how it was when I was uh, younger. And then open source happened, and it turned everything upside down. People said, no, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to own what you produce. You can give it to everybody. You can open a project on GitHub, and thousands of people can fork it and do whatever they want with it. And it sort of seems to me that innovation happens more rapidly that way, the second way, not the first way. Um, so, that was a huge change in this kind of thinking and in the way we operate. And then, recently, a new thing happened. 
uh, blockchain happened. Uh, Satoshi did the first blockchain and then attached an economic value to projects which historically didn't have any value. So we were doing open source for many years without kind of attaching any monetary value or value, so to speak. Uh, there was an intangible value always in, in, in the projects. But now you can combine it together. So for a computer scientist, that is a really interesting shift from sitting in front of your kind of a bubble of uh, you know computer programming to something that you can uh, test with the real world and see if people are interested in it, right? So instead of spending time uh, on something that may work, you actually can get people interested in it, build it, deploy it, and use it within the community and monetize on it all in a single process and by doing this sort of a mar product market fit uh, iterations very, very rapidly. So that's what is very exciting uh, and that's what sort of fires me a little bit about the, the whole revolution. So what we do in the lab, uh, we focus on decentralization and different aspects of what it means to decentralize things. Um, and how we can engineer systems to achieve what the plan is in a decentralized fashion. It's not as trivial as people might think and also it often goes out of control because you're losing a certain um, kind of a control over what is that you are engineering such that you achieve the target goals. Um, so uh, decentralized systems evolution is a is a topic that, that we deal with. Autonomous systems, how they self-adapt, and also we do so, so we do research on blockchain, on smart contracts, and on, on self-sovereign identity systems as well. I could spend a lot of time talking just about self-sovereign identity and how it democratizes our own uh, access to identities. Um, so we, we kind of uh, take the space a little bit from the uh, higher perspective. And, and think uh, what does it mean, like how those systems work, how they are organized, how they are monitored. And I do, in my daily, day-to-day -day work, I actually spend a lot of time uh, detecting misuse and abuse and how systems that are supposed to be, as you are presenting for the better of the world, are used for making crime. Uh, so we work with the Norwegian law enforcement and we uh, help them to trace and track uh, misuse of, of blockchain technology and crypto assets in particular. Um, so my name is Manoj Janostavski, I'm from Norwegian uh, University of Technology and I lead the Decentralized Systems Lab. Uh, I'm originally from Poland, so I'm not a native Norwegian. And I am a computer scientist, but as I said, up, I have a little bit broader interests, and I try to link computer science with real world uh, and see how it happens. I need the bachelor of programming. Uh, I love programming, and I did my PhD on trying to understand what life means, what is life, and how life organizes itself and sustains itself. And, uh, try to replicate it in a kind of a uh, digital realm. So I, I really enjoy the synthetic biology term. I, I, I didn't work with it before, but we do a lot of uh, biology-inspired uh, systems um, in, in this line of work. I also am uh, a paragliding pilot. So if any of you are into paragliding, then talk to me definitely. Um, and I spend a little time in clouds with my head, but only, also the rest of my body, <laughs> like in the clouds. So I am a little bit there. Uh, all right. So uh, smart contracts. So let's go very quickly into a little bit of uh, uh, technology. So how many of you work with EVM, Ethereum virtual machine, and how is your uh, understanding? Yeah, so it's a bit of a spread. Fine. <laughs> so let's see superficially, like what is your kind of intuition? So two more questions to go and then we done. So if we think, so let, 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 let me stop it for a second. If we take the very uh, orthodox take, that we're not trying to cheat, 
we try to build a smart contract that is not malicious, that it's not gonna kind of swoop, you know, to uh, um, anything malicious. It's just like we really want to follow the rules and write an uh, immutable smart contract. So then, can, oh, sorry, I cannot, can I restart it? No, maybe not. All right, so, yes, we still can do it. So we can still uh, change and modify an immutable smart contract in the EVM. Okay, a little bit surprising. Um, so, some time ago, um, the, uh, the EVM language has been extended into a create tool, uh, kind of an opcode, and it allows people to resurrect uh, that contract. So what, what this was for was that Sometimes you had a contract, you call this self destroy that it went out, and then so come on, we actually have to clean up something or do something with it, so you could kind of resurrect it. Uh, and that, that function allowed you to kind of resurrect the existing contract without changing it uh, exactly the same way as it was, just to do some, um, some additional work. And it can be mis misused, so it can, that, that uh, mechanism can allow you to sort of. Uh, Re redo the contract in a completely different way, right? And if you think about it, then you would think, well, people will definitely use it for, um, you know, um, uh, carpet pools or, or, or some kind of a mischief, right? To, to trick people into a DAO and then suddenly the DAO is doing something else, right? But actually, no. Actually, um, so the, those are the two basic mechanisms for, for changing it. We, we're not going to talk about the, the technical details. Um, so what, it, it is not actually used for malicious use, uh, even though it could. W what is it used for mostly? What do people use it for? Okay. So... Um, then Biggest use is when you have a trading bot or some um, uh, maximum uh, extractable value bot which extracts some value from arbitrage and you want to change it uh, and the bot is doing a lot, of, a lot of things. You want to have a vanity address which has a lot of uh, zeros at front because then your costs for running are cheaper. So if you found a, a, a very good address which has a, very, a lot of zeros in front then you want to reuse it because it actually saves you cost. It, it is kind of a very good thing to, to have. But if you deploy one contract there, then this address is blurred. You cannot like reuse it. But with this mechanism, you can. So most people use this mechanism to actually repurpose the address that they own to do different things in different contexts such that they minimize the costs. Right? If there is an economical incentive. Is it surprising? It was surprising for us to discover that. And it is something that I, I kind of talk about here to demonstrate that some uh, outcomes of your plan may not work out the way you think. So we thought majority of people will misuse it for malicious thing, but actually they use it for legitimate thing to minimize the cost. All right, so there is another problem. Uh, the blockchain has a lot of uh, contracts which have been dead. So like somebody deployed something, um, used it or tested something and then it's dead. Um, and th that creates a problem. So you have a lot of hanging contracts and you have a lot of uh, overheads related to that. So then uh, they occupied storage, they occupied processing space and so on. So the consortium came up with, uh, all right, with the idea that let's incentivize people to call self destruct. So if they don't need that contract anymore, in, let's incentivize people to call self destruct such that the contract is marked as that. And then all these overheads are kind of, um, you know, lifted. Who thinks that's a good idea? Do, do I ask them? Uh, yeah, is it a good idea? Who thinks it's a good idea? I thought it's a good idea. What can possibly go wrong? You don't know until you, you try, right? So they did. They deployed. Um, so what happened was, um, it's not a good idea. 
So this is kind of a daily cost of gas and Ethereum, uh, a snapshot of data, right? Okay, so, nothing unusual. Unless you realize that sometimes gas is really expensive and sometimes gas is really cheap. What will happen if you in initiate contracts when the gas is really cheap and then sell this truck when the price is really high? You're going to make money. And that's what people did. So they used the mechanism to clean up the blockchain to actually pollute it even more by creating those stupid contracts like which do nothing when the gas is really cheap and then sell this truck when the price is really high just to speculate on the price of the gas. Right? So what happens is uh, on August 21, the consortium kind of rolled up the change to incentivize the, um, the uh, cleaning up of the blockchain. After a few months, they said yeah, that was a really bad idea. Like it's worse than it used to be before. We have like a lot of hanging contracts which are kind of uh, polluting the blockchain even more. So they have to roll it back. They actually de-incentivize doing this. So the, um, um, the, 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 the project kind of uh, backfired, right? Um, all right, so some people did well. Congratulations. Maverick leading the, the pack. So, um, the point, the moral of the story is that you may not know what will happen. In open, democratic, uh, decentralized systems, the outcome is almost always unknown. Uh, almost always, economic pressure will produce something. Uh, which you may or may not predict, uh, but trying things out is sort of um, the, the name of the game. So if you have uh, interest in, uh, in the lab of, of what we do, uh, yeah, please contact me. So, thank you. Thank you right there. For short questions, yes. I wanted to ask you this question so much. Um, how do you define decentralization? So, yeah, the decentralized system is a system without a single central controller. Yeah, so, so I know, but from your perspective, right? So, both parties. Yeah, so for example, a DAO with a single address and a single person controlling it is not a decentralized organization, right? Uh, it, it needs to have this kind of uh, uh, certain characteristics which provide a lack of control. Uh, so, certain things emerge. Uh, by interacting with the stakeholders, not controlled kind of top-down fully. Uh, so, we do have uh, decentralized systems, we have kind of uh, hybrid systems, and we have fully centralized systems. So, depending on the country, depending on the historical kind of uh, governance models, we used to have a tendency to either centralized or decentralized, right? Uh, so, there is kind of no, no really black and white. There is always sort of a nuance, but sometimes people claim the system is decentralized where there is no uh, decentralization. It's just a, you know, benevolent dictator dictating everything. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. And definitely contact uh, Marius if you would like to do some engineering sanity check regarding your DAO or, or project. Yeah. Thank you. Organization and she will talk about like what the hurdles and possible IP problems in, in DAO and who owns what in reality. Hey everyone, thank you for having me here and uh, really, really excited to, um, to talk about DAOs in design and uh, what are we doing in Estonia and Europe and from my own perspective. Uh, just a second, my settings. Um, uh, so, I will just uh, start asking uh, who are you in the DAOs here today, currently? Quite many actually, wow, that's so cool, how did you get there? <laughs> <laughs> this is like so specific event, you know. Uh, uh, I am 
very delighted. Uh, I mean, thank you once again, Patrick, uh, for organizing this event because it's very hard to get these crowds together, and we have experienced that one. We organized with internet organization uh, last year the DAO Day, which is this uh, DAO conference, also in Russia. Uh, okay, at the same time I'm talking about that, that's multitask, I'm really sorry, that's fun. <laughs> uh, so, really much appreciate it. Uh, so, thanks again. How much time do I have? 20 minutes? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so, I've been into blockchain space four years now. DAO space, uh, more deeper, two years. Today, I am speaking on behalf of Internet Organization, Internet Organization, which is a two years old organization, uh, NGO, actually, non profit in Estonia. And today's topic is what you see. Um, it's, it's quite complicated and it's very hard to put into a very uh, short period of time, especially if you have so different crowd here, which is uh, deep tech, deep DAO, uh, deep legal, maybe even someone. Um, and so we are talking about how we're coming from the academic consortiums uh, to collectively owned IPs and what it actually means in the uh, design space, what it means in the DAO area, and what it means to us, uh, to internet organization who is actually. Uh, kind of protecting the concept of DAO because uh, we are dealing with the uh, legalese, with the problems of legal challenges in the DAO space. We are trying to get some uh, some solutions there, and probably many many have heard uh, that it's not easy. And uh, yeah, I'm happy also to introduce uh, actually Vatten who is here with me today from the same organization. And we are both the co-founders of the Internet Organization. And uh, we started this journey and uh, we still are going further with this journey, together with you guys. <laughs> and I want to actually begin with one example from the history. Maybe you've heard, maybe not. Um, this is uh, from coming from the statistics. Um, Science, yeah, I can, I can say that. So you could just read the text. Um, what is important? The history, I mean, the year was 1908 um, when he looked like this, right? Very smart guy. He did the research and development. He uh, was a, literally a student in the mathematics and chemistry at Oxford, right? And then he went to work to um, a company and, and he worked under another um, person. Uh, which the person was his competitor in science, actually, because even though the scientist went to work to the uh, company, he still wanted to do his science, right? And um, he was at this moment when he got out with his uh, statistic, um, uh, statistics um, um, thesis or such, we can, we can, um, we, which, we, which we published, right? At this moment, he was not under the university, he was working for a company, but still, he was a scientist. And now we come to the problem, he couldn't publish the, uh, the work that he did under his own name, because it was prohibited by the company where he worked. And that was like so long time ago, and we are still actually there, right? Um, and if we talk about the universities or the companies or any other organizations that want to own the, uh, the right of 
the news, own the rights of, um, we give it, uh, all these kind of things, uh, what, what we can put under the IP generally, then we come to the very small thing, which is, it goes a bit centralized, right? And that is the main thing why we are here. We want to see more decentralization in the space. So I, I hope this uh, example from the history made sense for you. Um, and um, let's uh, move further. Just a short about myself. Uh, why I got here into this this area of decentralization and how, how why I feel that it's uh, why it's connected to my soul and why I cannot sleep normally anymore. <laughs> Because to be honest, it's I the eyes I see here. There is a lot of. I mean, some eyes are tired, but still you have you are so excited, right? We have yes, we have these different syndromes in us, right? And this is this twenty percent of the people who want to solve problems in the world, right? And um, I sometimes uh, feel sad that I am also part of these people, yeah. And um, so, yeah, four years ago I started with crypto compliance from the AML perspective and I entered the space very heavily because Estonia was so famous to give out crypto licensing, licenses and so on. Um, and what I realized there, I mean, I came from the real estate, which was a very centralized market. I came from logistics, which was a very centralized market. I came from uh, music industry. I, I've always been an entrepreneur and art, an artist and uh, I always wanted to do stuff, you know, like, let's do something, you know, uh, let's, let's organize something. And, and if you come through these industries where you always see that it's very hard to access the, the rights, um, and then you come to crypto industry and you see that it's still centralized in a ways. Um, then you might ask, like, okay, how to really solve these things? So, and that's why we founded the Internet Organization uh, to to get more um, understanding what is the difference between the decentralization and the real decentralization. You know. So here is a slide that I use most of the times when I speak on the stages. Um, that can go to everyone to make really, you know, what is this internet of an economy that we are living in right now, right? And um, I love uh, this baby, it's uh, not mine created, it's AI created that baby to me, of course. And uh, I mean, you can um, you can guess many times who is this baby? Anyone wants to vote for how can we make this baby? <laughs> Almost. This is our hero. Yeah. Uh, so if we look at this data there, uh, maybe yeah, let's let's uh, start with the data. What I always want to, um, even for this side people and even for um, DAO people, what is happening currently is like we are getting more centralized because of the APIs and AI and all this stuff. Probably you feel it, how the data goes under huge corporations, you know. And people don't understand this, that the more that we innovate in tech industries, deep tech and uh, whatever, it, electronics also, biolabs, so on, the data is, you know, okay, this is the goal, right? But um, this, if we see the number 2022, the increase of uh, the collaboration growth between different small companies it's 30% already 2022 so what it can be in 2023 we're going to see in the in the uh, this is coming this information everything is coming from the Stanford uh, AI report so you can check it out and uh, so what I want to say here that uh, we are dealing with a very important topic this uh, decentralization and how to get uh, this out of this bubble of uh, that small percentage of people are owning so much in our world. And now, the small percentage of the people who we have today here, can we actually together um, have this baby born with us, yeah? And raise uh, her or him up, like, very nicely, yeah? So for me, this is a DAO. And why it's a baby still? Because the boom that we are seeing is not actually adopted yet. Yes, this is happening, 
yes, DAOs are there, crypto is kind of sometimes adopted, sometimes not. But still, I have so much issues to talk um, with very smart people and to explain the mindset of what the DAO is and should be. And it's, uh, we are in a very early beginning. Uh, and if we talk about collaboration uh, in, in, in the world overall, then I want to just give you this example of uh, why... Um, yeah, so a couple of weeks ago I was uh, participating in this uh, conference which was Burning Man uh, ELS uh, event. Uh, Burning Man speakers and collaboration people came together to Tallinn, uh, approximately two, three hundred people. Uh, it was a conference, everybody talked there, you know, a kind of festival as well. Uh, what happened there was a very cool thing. Tao mindset was there. So every, each of the per people, uh, every person there was um, wanting to help, wanting to solve, wanting to contribute and not expecting so much to get back, you know. And this is the Tao mindset, which should be there. It's like you want to change, but you don't always expect some incentivization, you know. This should, this should be uh, the future uh, in the town landscape, this is what I am like. A kind of, I'm, I really want to see that more, but it's very complicated. And if, if I talk to Christopher, who is the, one of the founders of um, of the Burning Man Festival, then he said it was very hard in the beginning uh, to get this mindset um, done or to explain it, you know, for the crowds. And I think every, everything starts from there, uh, from our personal hearts and um, if we just want to sit and get, you know, we want to consume stuff and we want to get the ownership, we want to get the IP, we want to own it, we want to earn, we want to, you know, we want to be the guy or the, the queen, you know, of something. Um, this is the, where the problems uh, will start, you know. So, and now, again, we, can, we go back to the... Um, how the collaboration can work in such ways that uh, people are incentivized in the ways that um, they feel fair uh, and, and that the economy can actually grow at the same time in, uh, in a responsible way. So we, we call it the future of work, code collaboration and compliance. Probably everybody understands that this is actually a DAO, but some people, mm, this compliance part is like, ah, uh, can you delete that part? <laughs> So, um, we actually love this compliance part, because it's so, so challenging. It's like, oh my god, if you look into different DAOs, uh, legal frameworks, or how, how they build themselves up, and how they figure, like, and what they sell, um, it's, it's a very fascinating world, and uh, very fast growing, of course. Uh, so, this is us, right? Just sitting here, and it's like mirroring right now. Only difference is we are offline. Uh, they are online. And this is also us, right? Um, this slide is, you can make a picture of, or you can download it from our webpage, uh, internet.org. Uh, I know uh, created that. Uh, thank you, Vatan, also for the great uh, input there. And um, so this is how we see the DAO landscape. And um, you, can, you can find uh, yourself somewhere, probably, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, and this is the slide that I show to everyone, if I go to talk to universities or, you know, mainstream uh, people. And this is another slide that I show to everyone, because when we started two years ago, there was only two, uh, sorry, 4,000 uh, DAO organizations on chain. Right, right now, it's currently, it's 19,000, right? And the uh, market is heavily growing. And this is also what we show to the universities. Um, and so, uh, what is I don't know? What we have done? Once again, um, uh, just say we are 16 people and we're happy to collaborate more with you guys. You can join us, contribute whatsoever. We can uh, continue to, to investigate the landscape more. Uh, what we have done so far uh, and why, why we are talking about the collaboration with universities and such uh, is because we are in the regulatory uh, landscape, uh, heavily in. And we are not so maybe talking about it all the time. 
Uh, but we are doing the research, so please go to our website, read the, uh, read the articles that we have wrote. Uh, it's very um, And also we are in the European Chain Regulatory Sandbox, uh, where we helped, or helping currently also, the EU level of that regulation, how you should definitely, uh, how, how you should define that, oh, that's, that was the question that we started with, actually, that's a very complicated one. And uh, also, b besides legal research, we are dealing with the INO concept creation. So, which means that you have um, um, connection. It's a legal and tech together. So you, you can you can kick off internet organizations in the future uh, more efficiently. Um, that was like a very long intro. Yeah. But now we in the topic of the day. Um, so, what are the academic consortiums? general problems actually today and uh, how it's connected to our uh, design world and the IP uh, revolution that we currently have and with which the Vitadao for example and every, um, others they, in the panel they discussed uh, these topics a lot so I just listed these um, problems that came like straight away from my mind um, and also I did research what's actually currently happening in Estonia in this uh, um, uh, in the head of people who are in the space of in university consortiums, uh, and so what I what I got to know is that um, everybody is talking about ethical solutions, and um, when I talk to the uh, research and development lead leaders uh, who are leading in the, for for example in Teltec, um the research group. Um, who are writing the grants uh, in different sectors like uh, uh, yeah, electronics or, or mechatronics or um, uh, data science, then the main, main problem was there that nobody wants to um, say out that actually this ethics uh, is sometimes not um, there, you know. And students and uh, researchers are in a bad position uh, next to the university, especially if they just enter, you know, because it's all about personal relationships in the end. Sometimes, I imagine you're a researcher and you and you go to the university first time you see the people, and uh, and then now you have to start negotiating your agreement, your contract in your research project, and how much of any ownership can you get there. And so, um, yeah, so the, the list of the problems are, of course, uh, it's a long list. And um, the. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess the uh, most important uh, um, point, what, what I found out in Estonia is the patent um, problem in the electronic industry is that you can see the point that, uh, that first of all the problem is you cannot find the patent so easily uh, and the, the research news can die at the same time. Second, the data lost in the uh, translation when you apply which means that let's say you have a patent in China which is in Chinese language and you want to go for uh, uh, in, from Estonia, and the, the lawyer who is dealing with this problem, they will sometimes lose the, trans, lose the data in the translation process. So these are the problems uh, we have, we have uh, gathered, and also, the, of course, the cost of lawyers is very high. Uh, yeah, so thank you, and um, yeah, happy to talk once again. Thank you. I want to give you a quick uh, fireside chat by Anka Pedro from Antrise and Filippo Franciani from Nordic and Nordic Blockchain Association. And we will discuss about what's happening in decentralized clinical trials and using blockchain, te blockchain technologies uh, for pharma industry.
Um, so, as Patrick mentioned, this conversation will be about decentralized clinical trials. We'll be talking a lot about um, design uh, from the very R&D perspective. And so now we're going to look into the larger drug development cycle and see how some of these principles could or could not be applied. So with us, clinical front drug and product manager uh, at Novo Nordis, also involved in the Nordic Blockchain Association. Uh, just to kick off things, uh, maybe discuss about the process of a clinical trial. Uh, which is something that takes a very long time. We test drugs in a lot of different uh, type of people to identify security risks and so on. And this is a process that has, of course, a lot of different challenges and pitfalls. Uh, what are some of those that you've specifically identified that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so first of all, uh, just a very quick introduction. Um, I, I represent the one artist here, which is a large pharma company it's working with many diabetes and weight loss drugs. Um, so I'm the bad guy here in the room, uh, compared to all of you working in the house, but uh, I'm also here to learn and, and see how we can work together. Um, I'm also part uh, of Nordic Blockchain Association, so I'm, I'm really uh, I'm, I'm on the blockchain technology and, and how this can be used in the healthcare space. So, yeah, uh, down to the clinical trial space. Um, yeah, I would say that in general, uh, the clinical trial and in drug development, uh, the whole process is, is not set up for modern technologies in general. Very regulated, very costly, very long. I remember your slide, Anka, from yesterday about the, the more low uh, costs are increasing, time, time, uh, time span is increasing uh, to develop new drugs. So, well, in general, I think there's uh, plenty of pitfalls, uh, mainly related to patient recruitment and patient engagement. Um, right now, um, patients need to sign an informed consent when they want to be part of a trial, meaning that they need to go to the doctor's office, fill a form, um, sign, and then the doctors will perform a visit, and then you will assess whether the patient is, uh, is uh, suited to, to be part of the trial. So it requires patients to be present. Um, it, it's really rare that we have remote um, clinical trial setups and remote uh, informed consent signing. So I would say, yeah, um, there, there's plenty of people. Uh, also, during the clinical trial, it can last for years. Patients need to go to the doctor's office to get their vital signs or the blood sample. So, it is really not set up for, for remote uh, in general. So I would say decentralized clinical trials, and now I'm not talking about blockchain specific decentralized clinical trials, are the way to go, I would say. So it's interesting because we do not all understand the same thing when we talk about decentralized clinical trials and it's from where we come from. Um, when you have the biopharmaceutical side of things, a decentralized clinical trial is pretty much decentralizing in the terms that it's not going to happen 100% in a hospital, it's going to happen at a patient's home, parts of it. Uh, some of the follow-up will happen at home, so you have all your mobile applications and your, all your assistants that will decentralize the way that you conduct that study. And then you have the web free crowd who understands by decentralized clinical trials, a clinical trial that is based on blockchain. So depending where you come from, a decentralized clinical trial can be two very different things. Uh, which one is for you and which one do you want to talk about? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if I if I go and talk with the, with my boss uh, in the pharma industry, we, we actually believe that decentralized clinical trials are actually remote clinical trials, meaning that um, the data is not collected in, in a central way, meaning that it's not collected at the doctor's office. So I think there's different uh, layers of decentralization, and uh, we we are starting from the first part. So um, allowing for remote data collection, for example. Um, using uh, digital health trackers, uh, using uh, the devices, for example, uh, to, to remotely collect uh, information about patient health and so on. So, or telemedicine. Uh, so, this is something we are really looking into. Uh, while, of course, uh, a lot of this, uh, this remote uh, monitoring and uh, data collection procedure could also be integrated with blockchain technology. I must say that uh, blockchain in this case is not the cure for everything. So we need to understand where can actually blockchain help. Uh, and, and blockchain is a great technology when you have uh, a lack of trust between parties. So of course the more data you're collecting and the more the data is flowing across devices, different databases, then the more you need blockchain to enhance security. 
So, to me, um, I see the pharma industry moving towards that direction, but we are still pretty early. So, definitely, we have a lot to learn from uh, from DAOs as well. I think that you can make an argument that trust and transparency is like a, a luxury thing that people would want to have, but it's not necessarily a priority sometimes. Um, I mean, everyone wants to conduct a trustworthy clinical trial, but a lot of people don't really realize that there are problems to begin with in that process. And I'm talking about that because at the very beginning of this blockchain movement in healthcare, a lot of pharmaceutical companies would tell me, we don't have any transparency problems, we don't have any trust trust problems. Everything is super well documented. And I think there is, I don't know if it's the fact that they, they're not aware of the problems or they're just in denial of the problems, but the first step in making a change is realizing that something is wrong. What are some of the things that you think blockchain can address that are inherently wrong with clinical trials? So, of course, um, the setup is very strict in terms of clinical trials because it's very heavily regulated, and you need to um, you need to ensure patient safety at any moment in time when you're working with sensitive data. So this is heavily regulated. So we have, of course, plenty of security measurements in place. <laughs> However, um, we can really whenever you have uh, data being collected and shared across the platform, you can really uh, prove that the data is not being tampered with. So, of course, we own the data, it's not the patient is owning the data, so we could tamper with it. We don't want to do it because we want to prove that our drug is safe and we don't want to have risks when we're marketing the drug uh, uh, for real, in the real world. So, um, I would say it's both for us and, and for the regulators that we want to enhance the security. So, I think blockchain can really help to um, to have a full traceability of, of how this data is shared uh, um, and also enhance the security of, uh, of how the data is stored and processed across the various systems. Um, I would say uh, another interesting aspect is the, the whole um, informed consent part. So potentially you could also um, you could also have digital identifiers linked to, to patients' identities so that patients can can sign whatever the data is, is, is used by a pharma company, can view how the data is being used, um, yeah, and how it's shared. Uh, right now it's really siloed in a way that the patient uh, signs a consent for one specific trial, uh, and then if you want to go on another trial, you have to redo the process from scratch, uh, and redo the visit, re redo the question, and so on. So, um, using blockchain would definitely help to, to reshare this data further, and yeah, research in general. I think that patient data management with blockchain, the whole conversation that you can have, is specifically on the fact that do patients actually want to have more control over their data? And this is a larger topic about having more control over any type of data in general, not just health data, but health data being particularly sensitive. Because today we do have some degree of control over some of our data, uh, specifically I'm thinking when you access a website and they ask if you want to give consent for the website to use your data to track your activity. How many of you here actually read that text before clicking accept? You do? You actually read it? No, no, no. You actually read the terms and conditions? No, I don't. You don't. <laughs> Right, so we, we do have some kind of empowerment to have more control over our data, but none of us really use it. So my question is, will we use that control if we actually can manage our health data each time someone wants to use our data? Will we spend our time actually reading the protocol of the study and agree or not? Or will we just go accept, accept, accept to move faster? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question and also uh, from the talk from before from William, I believe uh, when we were, we were seeing this molecule, this cell being shared for over 70 years uh, and that the family was actually interested in having both in rights on how this data is being used. I think that's very interesting but uh, it, it doesn't represent the majority of the population, I would say. Um, we're giving out data on a daily basis through any connected devices we have. We, every, everyone, like Apple knows our geolocation. They know uh, what we like on social media. 
um, our heartbeat is given out on a daily basis, and people don't really care. But uh, but I guess some people would care. So I would say definitely there's space to to do something there. Um, but but having it's not a system that would work for everyone. So of course there needs to be probably some incentives related to to the fact that, that I'm giving out the data. Um, but also the educational part is, is quite important, and uh, not everyone will probably be willing to to read out all the all the policies, and uh, they will just accept. Okay, I'm going to get to help token spec can be used. But yeah, I don't think it's gonna, it's going to work for everyone. Um, but also in the pharma space and the clinical trials, it's quite regulated how. Um, patient data is viewed and used, and who can see that data during the, the trial. Um, so, you have a, a process of blinding of the data, meaning that patients don't really see their data throughout the trial. Uh, that can also be because it can bias them. Um, so, if, if they actually see how their health is, is changing throughout the initial stage of the trial, then maybe they will act differently. So, it would change my initial research statement. So, so also the, the setup of the trials is not done in a way that patients should own the data uh, because it can bias the actual results of the of the study. So, I think it needs to be rethought a little bit from a regulatory perspective. Absolutely, that's, that's also a point to make: the fact that all of this data is very liquid in the sense that when it is collected for the purpose of that trial, it pretty much stays within that trial and cannot be reused, which is what we often call the secondary use of health data, which is using it for other purposes, other than what it was intended for initially. And so that goes to say that we have all these massive databases of very good quality and structured data that clinical trials that cannot be reused, or if it is reused, that requires massive consent and regulatory processes. And also this is something that some web-free companies are trying to address. Yeah, for sure. And I think also DAOs are doing an inter interesting work there, uh, both in terms of feeding, uh, feeding data into potential drug development, uh, but also to reuse some of this data. Um, it's not something that is done right now inside the, the pharmaceutical drug development, but potentially there could be some, some place where we use. Um, yeah, also, I mean, the data has always been centralized, and the uh, pharmaceutical company might not be willing to give up their data so easily. Uh, but I hope we're, we're going to be moving towards a uh, yeah, different approach. And are there specific projects that Novo Nordisk is involved in in the web free space? So, I would say um, we have started investigating some blockchain projects uh, related to mainly what we call ePro, so electronic patient reported outcome. So, we have that, we are actually doing some clinical trials where we provide patients a uh, smartphone and uh, they can actually um, record some data, for example, related to questionnaires related to their health or their um, psychological situation that we actually load on, on, a, on a private blockchain. Um, the reason why we, we're doing it is to uh, ensure that the, the data is not tampered with. So, usually how you collect this data from questionnaires is that the, the patient would go to the doctor's office and pick a question, or they would do it online, and then the doctor will receive the data, and then the doctor will actually fill it up manually, data entry into a system, and we will receive it. So we have actually set up a, a blockchain a ledger to, to basically load the data directly from this device that the patients have and onto the blockchain. So, so basically it's immutable and, uh, and uh, yeah, and traceable. And private blockchains, talking about here. Right, I was going to ask if other firms or companies are involved in this uh, project or is it just normal for now? So this one is just null for now. We have done this project together with Microsoft, uh, but you know, mainly pharma companies are working with IBM or you know Hyperledger, Fabric, and all these uh, well-known players. We're also a bit skeptical to, to go with the smaller protocols. We're we're not really risk averse, uh, and we're not first movers in the pharma industry. So we are quite often waiting that others try it out. And uh, regulations are allowing us to do it, and then we move. Uh, 
Um, in this case, actually, before implementing this blockchain uh, system, we we had to have we had to have uh, plenty of conversation with the European Medicine Agency to understand whether they would accept such a solution. Uh, and once we got the green light, we actually implemented it. So uh, we are yeah quite tight in terms of regulations. And I have one last question for you because we've been talking about decentralized science all day today. And I was wondering what value it can bring to a pharmaceutical company because we've seen in the example of VitaDAO that a couple of pharmaceutical companies are under a scientific board. So I was wondering where do you see the value of DSI for a traditional pharma? So, yeah, also I asked the question to Eleanor before because I think a lot of the DAOs are focused on their early research, but then, yes. That's great, but you need to probably develop a drug if you want to, you know, enhance longevity. Uh, a research paper is not enough, so we need to find a way to collaborate together. Um, and my understanding is that with, with all the DAOs, the system works that you, pharma companies can actually buy the IP and then develop the drug in the usual way. Uh, but maybe there's different ways to collaborate. Maybe that can be. Um, co-run clinical trials where, where a DAO, for example, can fund a specific part of the clinical trial that is maybe um, not, not, interest, not interesting, but, but not interesting enough for a pharma company to, to pay some money to research that aspect. Uh, you know, for example, we, we heard about female health, uh, right? Um, I don't know the numbers from, from my company, but uh, um, yeah, so maybe that could be an interesting aspect. Uh, DAOs can also help uh, getting funding potentially for clinical trials, not for large pharma companies, but more for smaller ones. Um, yeah, or I mean, DAOs could even provide a full platform for running clinical trials. Why not? Uh, with a whole governance system. So I think there's many aspects where, where we can link up. Uh, I'm not talking about the research aspect because I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher. Uh, but on the clinical child aspect, I think that could be a few interesting ones. Maybe this is not the last question, the question goes to you and the people who are in the audience. I wonder, is it that we're not there yet, as in today DAOs are financing very early stage research, so we're not into the clinical trial space, or is there no incentive for DAOs to go as far as clinical trials? And should they stay in early research? This is really addressed to all of you, anyone wants to say something about that? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks, maybe, maybe uh, it, it's uh, related to the legal aspects, maybe, because uh, when we talk about DAOs, then uh, it's a bit confusing uh, in the landscape currently, right? The solution is kind of there, we're uh, reaching out to the solution, but uh, there is uh, a lot of questions still arising up, and uh, oh, we, we are not yet there uh, for the big option, you know. And it's it's in our hands, uh, for example, in, in all the laws that you have, be responsible legally, uh, be responsible yourself as a co founder, um, and give responsibilities to the DAO members as well. What is their responsibility if they join, and uh, how, uh, what is the limit of they can do and they can not do, you know, these kind of things. And un until this is not clear, uh, it would be misused for wrong funding, uh, wrong governance, and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, from my side, I would say I could see in some of the previous presentations that uh, Pfizer and Novartis are a company to join DAO's governance boards. So. I think there is an interest there, and they don't do it for the sake of research, I'm pretty sure. So, um, yeah, so, but I think a model needs to be in place. And from what I heard, that new to the hour and decide, to be honest, it's my first decide conference. Um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully not the last one. But uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I wish that uh, we had a solution for how to get involved, but it doesn't seem a uh, model in place yet. Well, thank you very much, Filippo. We'll let you go catch your flight. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next up, we will have.
Josh Blake from this side were joining me remotely and telling us about knowledge back economy and also a new product they launched called Proof of Knowledge. Hi Josh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? All right, yes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, we have uh, two still, still people in the audience and happy to hear what you're doing. Oh, hey everybody. Uh, I can't see you. So I can see me. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Two seconds. Uh, actually, I have to allow me to do it. Okay. 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 Um, and we actually are releasing a new dashboard, which some of you may have used, the dsi.org dashboard. Uh, it's the one that's been around since 2021. We're releasing a new one, a v2 version, uh, next month. Stay tuned for that. But this is actually a little exploration into the, the sort of uh, justification for our new technical product, which is called Proof of Knowledge. So I'm going to give a little bit of background about why Proof of Knowledge is important, and a little bit of the background of Proof of Knowledge itself. So this type of this uh, presentation is titled Knowledge-backed economy in an AI-driven future. Um, so we all know that the oh sorry, Joshua, I'm being so wrong. Follow us on Twitter. Go to our so we all know that the uh, the economy has changed a lot over the last 150 200 years. Uh, we've gone from primarily a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy. This occurred after automation took away about 80% of the manufacturing jobs over the 19th century, 20th century. Um, automation basically removed. People with the majority of the needs of manufacturing. And so now we are mostly a service based economy. But as AI scales and improves and becomes much more cheap and more powerful, the service based economy is also probably going to be automated away. Uh, lawyers, teachers, marketers, you know, cashiers, it's already happening in many places around the world. You can get a, uh, a supermarket to allow you to scan your own shopping because there's machines that do it for you. And so this service based economy is. Whereas we could no longer make, so we served. Now, if AI does the serve for us, what is it that we actually are providing uh, to the economy, to society? Um, so we're actually thinking that this is a big problem. And I know a lot of people are thinking this is a big problem. So we're trying to share one solution that we've come up with, which is called proof of knowledge. And the idea here is that when we cannot make and then we can no longer serve, what is it that humans bring to society? And we believe that humans bring knowledge. To society. So we want to try and create a knowledge backed economy. So to first understand what is knowledge backed, to first understand the knowledge backed economy, we should understand what is knowledge. And we're going to present two present, uh, definitions here. So the first one is the dictionary definition of knowledge, which is the sum of what is known. And this presents actually quite an interesting opportunity for humans because AI is very, very good at synthesizing that which is already known. The information which is already out there, they can take it and pass very effectively, very quickly from anywhere in the world. But one thing it is not doing right now is creating new knowledge or novel knowledge. And that is where the human ingenuity and the human brain comes into this over. And so this presents a wonderful opportunity for humans to produce things that AI needs to consume but cannot create itself. So if the sum of what is known is what the AI can utilize, then it's important that we continue to create things that are not yet known. And second definition of knowledge that we'll explore here is what we can consider canon, or the canonical understanding of the accepted knowledge. And so this is information that has gone out there and has been ratified or verified 
uh, or accepted by some kind of institution. Is it Wikipedia? Is it the media? Is it a university? Is it an expert group? Uh, is it a government? And so these are pieces of information which are considered to be true or factual, and it becomes canon. There's many examples throughout history of the canonical acceptance changing quite rapidly. You think of Galileo as the most, uh, most popular example, how the, uh, the idea of the world being the center of the universe changed once some of these uh, observations were made. And we've all heard the stories about how he was vilified for this change of canon. And so it's an important thing to understand is that that which is already accepted and that which is known can change. And so that does present, again, some new avenues for innovation and for new knowledge to be created from the human brain. So what we have is a sort of new stage, potentially here in the economy, from a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy, both of which also makes the way to what we consider the knowledge-backed economy. Now, the when, you, when you're creating an economy, such as a manufacturing economy, you can value the inputs and the outputs from the raw materials and the work that you're creating. On a service-based economy, you can also value the services in the way of uh, valuing human labor and the cost of demand for those services. So how do you value knowledge in a knowledge-backed economy? So we're going to try and explore this question here. And the, the system that we're creating is actually built to value knowledge and maintain some of that value for the knowledge creators, the authors of that knowledge. So currently in our, in our world at the moment, we have two core ways of value knowledge. That which is the, the patenting system, or the intellectual property system, and then the institutional grants and prizes system. So the patenting system is the most common way to value the knowledge. You get your knowledge to some kind of productive end, and then you patent it, and it has a value on it. You either pay for the shares or purchase the patent from you. And this is common amongst most products, such <clears throat> cleaning products, pharmaceuticals, bi uh, biotech, and things like fertilizers, and, and basically most things that are taking science and knowledge and turning them into some kind of event. And also, quite clearly, uh, something that's really important in the news right now is weapons of war, and actually, generally, the military industrial complex is the main driver of R&D uh, in research and science right now. And that's because it's very profitable to do so, right? So to be a scientist, to be uh, sort of asked to, to study or to, to to create more knowledge about uh, jet propulsion or you know fuels or some kind of explosives, it's a really quite a powerful uh, source of income for you because of this system. And so some of the incentives are really skewed towards uh, some dangerous outcomes for research. And on the university side, on the institutional side, uh, you have knowledge which is considered in, in advance to be valuable for a grant. Right? So you spend some time writing a grant, and your knowledge is supposed to be valuable, so you get upfront payment or retroactive payment in the form of Prize and some other prizes here. And generally, this is actually very inefficient and leaves the door open for a lot of uh, biases, a lot of grift, a lot of corruption. So, these two systems have got us pretty far, got us to the stage where I can present to you from my country, but at the same time, there's a lot of issues here that we have to address in how you actually value the knowledge itself. And this is, in my opinion, the primary concern with the valuation of knowledge, apart from the inefficiencies and the opportunity for grift and the opportunity to bias incentives towards unpleasant outcomes such as weapons of war, this is a massive problem as well. And this is an analogy of that problem. So this analogy dictates how when you're researching, you're creating your knowledge, eventually that knowledge or that research becomes some kind of productive end that can be patented, for example. And what happens here, this is an analogy of that. So you, this sprout, this plant, is the productive end of your knowledge. You've thought about something, you've researched it, and you've created a product which is now a sprout. You've been given the seal of approval from the institutions, the expert groups, and now you can get paid for that. This is a good idea, and people are willing to pay for it. However, in reality, that plant is actually built on the soil of the ideas of others, right? You have many, many years of foundational research, and many, many years of that frame of foundational research being built upon and referenced, and your ideas may be built upon ideas about this and likely is. However, in the end, the final productive output is the one that gets paid. So what about all these ideas here? Were they not useful? Of course not. Without the soil, the plant cannot grow. Right? But we have to find a way to maintain that soil. Okay? The soil of ideas in this case is being is, is being neglected. And so a lot of researchers will do foundational research, they'll do just research that they hope to become productive, it doesn't quite get there, and then they are left into the mire. 
And because of these incentive mechanisms, you generally scientists either don't make a very good living or they have to go through some kind of corporate infrastructure to make enough money because these ideas are not valued. The only value is this final idea here. So this leads us to a conclusion that all knowledge or everybody's brain has some kind of value to give. Whether or not you know it, your knowledge could be the foundation of somebody else's productive final knowledge about productive final end. This does present a concern with many people in terms of saying that everybody has knowledge and that everybody has value in their brain, everybody's knowledge is valuable. It does leave us the concern of misinformation, which is something that is really prevalent right now. Of how well, if everybody has something to say, why should we listen to everything they say? Well, ultimately we are in a crisis of truth right now, and there's you know shepherds out there who lead us to say things are true, things are not. And ultimately, we're sort of getting to a point where because of the technology that we have, because of, in particular, Web3 and crypto, the self-sovereign mindset, we should be able to make these decisions ourselves and inform ourselves based on an understanding of that knowledge. So what we are trying to build here is a proof of knowledge. Essentially, proof of knowledge, shorthand here, POK, uh, is an attestation or a, a referencing system that allows your knowledge to be tracked, the chain of provenance to be maintained in perpetuity. So when your knowledge is built upon, people can see what that knowledge was built upon. And you can track, users can track the whole way down in order to incentivize and value that knowledge, but also to maintain that, maintain that chain of provenance so you can decide yourself on the truth of the matter. So I'm gonna briefly explain uh, proof of knowledge, the system itself. So to create proof of knowledge, we need four core things. We need a knowledge graph, a decentralized knowledge graph. We need to put that knowledge graph on chain, or certain aspects, the vectors of that knowledge graph must go on chain, so that we can track the, the provenance of the, of the information. Once you have an on-chain vector database with these first two steps, then you can utilize AI using RAG LLM systems to pass that data at a scale very effectively. Now you have AI pulling vectors from this vector database, which are created by individual users, and so you can assign value to those pieces of knowledge as they're queried. And DeSign World steps in here as a, with a baseline incentive layer. So we create a decentralized knowledge graph from individual users providing their knowledge. We attach parts of it on chain, allow that to be read by AI, and then we can assign value or scores, a ranking of the knowledge, and provide an incentive layer there. So the, the core uh, function here, the core way we bring information on chain into this knowledge graph is through this thing called an n-gram. Now an n-gram is our creation, it's modeled after the n-gram in the brain, which is uh, a unit of cognitive information, it's a theoretical substance where apparently your memories are stored. It's still something that we have yet to understand in our own brains. So the knowledge n-gram, k is silent, it's just an n-gram, allows us to track and quantify the knowledge, and once you can track and quantify it, then you can assign a value to it. So the n-gram is in effect a wrapper for your knowledge, or a knowledge oracle, a way to take the knowledge off-chain and bring it on-chain. Just like Chainlink does so for prices and other such data, we do so for knowledge. And here, this is where the n-gram fits in, is the knowledge graph being brought on-chain. So you can contribute to a knowledge graph by creating an n-gram, and the n-gram is in itself an on-chain structure. The n-grams are then read by AI, in which you can then start to accumulate incentives. In effect, this is what it looks like. You have a chatbot, and you ask it a question, what's the meaning of life? And it will tell you the meaning of life is, or as an AI, I can't make that decision, but you should look into, into, these, uh, into these resources. And you will in hyperlink the, here, the response. Each response that it gives you has hyperlinks, maybe one, maybe 10, and those hyperlinks are directly linking to the underlying engram that it used as context in its response. So it will synthesize the context from many engrams that are relevant, produce a nice small answer for you, but it will aggregate that answer to all of the underlying data. So we know that OpenAI does not do this, for example. You can type in some things about, uh, you can type in any query, it will produce a response. We know that that response comes from its database, but we don't know which data, and we know that for a fact that data is not being incentivized. So whenever your data is hyperlinked here, you get a point, and those points are linked later incentivized with incentives. So what we do here is actually we place the human back at the center of the AI-driven future. Because we know whenever we receive a response, that it's not the AI itself being super, super smart, 
It's the AI being super smart based off of the knowledge of very smart individuals. And this is a really big change in the mindset as well. It's when you have the black box of AI, it's kind of terrifying or inspiring to see it just be so brilliant. But when you know that the human is the person that actually informed that brilliance, it really changes the mindset to say, actually, we are worthy of something. And another interesting use case of the engram is actually you can group many people's ideas together and contain them and produce a chatbot that speaks the mind of those people. So you can actually create collectives. Imagine everybody in the Decide Nordics uh, group right now decided to create their own engrams and decide to maybe talk about their thoughts on Decide. Then there would be a chatbot that is informed by the Decide Nordics point of view on Decide. And so people could speak to this chatbot and say, what does Decide Nordics think of Decide? And it's going to tell you. And it's going to tell you based on the opinions or the, the information gathered from the participants. And so eventually what actually happens here is you create a ranking system for knowledge. When your knowledge is, is a high point, you're getting a point. And now you can actually see how this knowledge, this context is valued by society, by usage, in relation to other pieces of knowledge. So in the end, we hope that proof of knowledge at scale can enable a knowledge-backed economy in order to help us through this transition period that I'm sure we're all kind of concerned about as AI continues to replace jobs. The current sequence is this, and this is a bit more of a meta point, in which humans, students, researchers provide their knowledge to an institution. Is it a publisher, is it a university, is it a patenting service, or whatever. And then in the end we get what we consider to be canon. This is a very centralized system. As you can see, there is one bottleneck, and it's the institution. And that in itself is great for quality control, but also great for inefficiency bias and grift. In a revised sequence in which AI dominates the playing field, but humans are the underlying to the AI, there is a much more messy, but also much more organic and beautiful system here in which individuals, let's consider this to be individuals, individuals cooperate with AI, Operate with institutions and institutions and cooperate with those individuals. And it's a much more holistic system in which AI facilitates that exchange between institution and individual and individual and individual. So I hope that was informative. I hope you guys are excited for the release of this. It comes out in about three, four months. Um, that's my Twitter. Please feel free to follow me on Twitter, reach out to me there. If you want to speak to me otherwise, I have a Telegram and email, and I'm happy to share that. Uh, this is a lovely image. We're building a bonfire, okay? And you build the fire, you make it big enough, eventually people will come as things get colder. That's our ambition here, so it might take some time. We're building a nice warm fire, and hopefully more people will join, start to get more knowledge put out there, get their knowledge discovered and read, and also incentivized. So I hope you'll join us on the fire. Thanks, guys. Yeah, there is one. I'm going to bring the next uh, Thanks for the talk. Uh, do you have the knowledge graph already of uh, your team, for example? Yeah, so can, you can hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So we're actually using internally at DSI World, we're creating our own knowledge graph for our internal operations. So it's essentially an AI hole, it's just a small uh, vector database that consists of our daily operations. We have a channel on our Telegram where we've built the bot, and we forward all of our just random what we're doing today, any conversations we've had, any notes from a meeting, uh, anything we need. We forward that just, you know, without any concern into this channel, and the, the bot will eat it and turn it into a vector as tested to our Telegram address, and then you can query this bot to say, you know, what's the team being up to today, or when was the last time we spoke with this partner? And it has a working uh, knowledge of the whole thing, and it works incredibly well, actually. And so every day, our CTO puts in a summary, which is produced by the AI. We sort of give it a structure, like a newsletter, and it says, today, you so well. It's fun. But it's, it, the thing about this is because it's a vector database, it's incredibly uh, flexible. We can do anything we want with it, right? We can say, write a story, uh, write a two, a two paragraph story about these side world's operations this week. And it'll create some fun thing. It's just a really interesting way to deal with the information because once you have the vectors, then the AI can produce anything. Uh, and uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, will you, for example, if I uh, 
have the uh, same ideas that you have for somebody else. So that's uh, quite often. Uh, and uh, you build the economy upon it. Uh, so the first guy will get something and uh, all the rest will just uh, sit there. Yeah, so, I mean, there's two things. Like, if you're putting identical information or nearly identical information, it then becomes a battle of query in the sense of why would the AI choose your context over somebody else? Maybe that's because it's better written or because it's better referenced and there's references to other people's ideas and that way it's more discoverable because the chain of context is, uh, is more complete. Um, ultimately, that then becomes a sort of thing where if you and two other people have the same idea, it becomes almost a way for you to lobby for your own knowledge. Um, the interesting thing about the, the points distribution is that each end round has a defined point distribution. So the default is 50-50, but you can actually customize this to incentivize people to, to work on your knowledge tree. But the, the point is that so you're, you get a citation, the points come to you, and then 50% of the points are distributed to your nearest neighbors. And then your nearest neighbors distribute 50% of their points to their nearest neighbors. And depth of, we're thinking of depth of five. Um, and so this is a way for people who are working on your chain of information to continue to benefit as, your, as the final endpoint is what gets queried. But if you have three separate trees, each with the same starting point and the same information, then it becomes a battle of the ideas. And you have to essentially lobby for your information to be the one that's most interesting through other people building on top of it. Then you have a chain which is much more discoverable. Or um, the, the way that you write it, the way you present the information. Uh, another question. Uh, how do you protect this data? Like, I know you mentioned Bragg. Right. Uh, I mean, drag is ideal approach. Right. Uh, this is what you want to see. But uh, what prevents people from just scrapping the data and then use it further or train an LLM model uh, on the same data? Yeah. So, if I understand correctly, taking the information from the database once it's in there, do you mean? Yes. How do you prevent that? Yeah. So, RAG, as I'm sure you're aware, is kind of like soft encryption, right? Like in the sense that. Once the information is in the vector, if you want to discover the vector, you have to query it and it will produce a response that uses your vector as context, but doesn't directly quote, often doesn't directly quote your context. It will say, you know, you can have 10 paragraphs and it will produce a two sentence response that uses that as context to inform it. So there is a form of soft encryption there in the sense of you have to ask exactly the right questions to get a portion of the information out of it. So I think that in terms of some people using the system to scrape it and then, and then using that like for plagiarism, I think that's less of a concern. What is more of a concern for us is uh, people plagiarizing in the first place, creating engrams with other people's information from the internet. And then we have a number of mechanisms, including an incentive for properly citing, uh, and I don't want to go into it now, but we have these things called research collectives, in which we're incentivizing to basically monitor the, uh, the effect of referencing and providing some kind of reputation to the, the end grounds and then this, this uh, determines a little bit more of the discoverability and the points allocation. So we are creating mechanisms to aid in plagiarism at the source, um, but it's a problem across the entire academia, especially in an open source software environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about like computational uh, Requirements like let's say that this will scale like okay, okay the vector is like that relatively can be lightweight but how would you see this scale uh, on on a real like global scale and would it be like individual units internally using it and then opening up some of it or or it would be part of like one global network that's like really truly lives like decentralized and how who would uh, support the is it the computational resources for this yeah. So to begin with, obviously these things take time to scale. So to begin with, we imagine that the on-chain community will be the primary users of this, as you have to attest to using your wallet. So let's just say two million people over the next two years. Um, for that, to begin with, we have our own rack, and we're going to begin with our own rack, and we're going to begin accumulating uh, smaller GPUs, so like half A100, but like half-sized ones, because we need more, less computational power, but more actual GPUs, because the stack overflow. Um, so we'll be for that for our own usage. That's what we're going to be doing, and we'll subsidise a lot of that. Um, moving from that, as you mentioned, it, it is what you consider a local brain. We we'll call it a brain colloquially, a local vector database for your specific needs. Like we have the so World, maybe you have your own company, and those interconnect to the global network. So you have your local brain, which again, for the beginning stages, we offer hosting. But you could eventually host it yourself if it becomes large enough and you need your own computational power. 
the local brains and then our system connects those local brains to the global brain. So it's immediately discoverable. Think of it like a librarian where you can query a group of knowledge and it will say, you should go to this book and read this book. It's, you should go to this bot or this brain and query this brain. It's more of like a, a librarian function rather than directly pulling information from each of the brains themselves. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you just for joining us and definitely we will look for the release. Okay. Thank, Thank you guys. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So I hope we can have like a few minutes break for stretching, but at two o'clock, so in a few minutes more than Danny Nutten from the University of Copenhagen will join us and he's left us the first to do an actual IP NFT transaction. So he will tell about the researcher aspect, what they do, what this asset is about, and what did it make him to actually work together with Molecule to do this first transaction. Pessoal, agora eles estão fazendo um, um intervalinho aí. E episódio qual? 565. É. Show. Os, os caras não conseguem, velho. Eles têm, eles têm que ficar na frente da, da câmera. Senão não são eles. Deixa eu ver aqui. Como é que é pegar muito? Pode ser aqui, pronto. Uhum. Então pessoal, bom dia para todos aí. A live hoje vocês viram, né? A gente está no evento de Sai aqui e a gente está acompanhando esse evento desde cedinho. Eu acho que a gente perdeu uma ou duas palestras do começo porque a gente não conseguiu pegar ela desde o comecinho e não tinha um lugar tão legal assim que nem esse que está agora. Então está super bem posicionado aqui. Estamos conseguindo fazer toda a, todas as palestras e tudo mais. E de vez em quando para um tonto aqui na frente, né? E acaba meio que zoando a live, mas a gente está resolvendo a questão. Mas no geral, a live tá, o evento está falando de DSI, que é ciência né, é descentralizada. E o negócio do DSI é justamente você conseguir ou criar DAOs ou criar formas de fundiar a pesquisa por meio descentralizado. E isso é muito importante porque grande parte de pesquisas, principalmente muito early stage, não consegue funding. Inclusive o painel anterior, o cara deixou claro, ele falou que tem, tem muito painel, o cara era da indústria farmacêutica. Ele falou que tem muito, muito, muito projeto que não é do interesse da indústria. Então eles não põem dinheiro, e se não põem dinheiro o negócio nem começa. Então, de repente, essas DAOs, para começar o projeto e depois tocar o projeto sozinho, ele ser adquirido, a indústria é, adquire, a propriedade intelectual, coisa assim, é, pode facilitar muito com que projetos que estão engavetados hoje passem a rodar. Então é isso. Vai voltar já já o evento. Eu botei uma câmera um pouquinho mais aberta para vocês verem o ambiente. Não está tão cheio, mas inclusive já tem uma galera que foi embora. Mas é um evento de ciência, né? A gente viu um monte de cientistas, pessoas trabalhando em projetos científicos, pesquisa, e a gente sabe como que é o mercado para isso, né? São poucas pessoas tentando fazer um negócio sério. Aliás, são poucas pessoas, né? E, e é uma área muito séria e chata, muitas vezes. Por favor. Calma, 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 calma. Então, é, é, esse tipo de evento é interessante porque tem várias iniciativas que eu já comentei, inclusive mais cedo, depois o vídeo vai estar no YouTube, vocês vão conseguir ver. Tem coisas muito interessantes que a gente consegue tirar desse evento aqui hoje. Né? Desde a parte de tokenização de propriedade intelectual até outras coisas que a gente comentou aí. Então, é, tem um caminho, tem um caminho acontecendo. Ah, e o, e o mais engraçado disso aqui é que eu consegui colocar um microfone pendurado no, no gimbal. Tem uma portinha no gimbal pra, que é para carregar um microfone, só que é uns microfones da Rode. E eu consegui colocar o, o microfone e tá pegando super bem. Tá pegando super bem. Né? Então, dá para chegar mais perto? 
A produção falou que dá para chegar mais perto aqui ainda. Ó, falou, eu tô com a lente mais aberta, porque aí o pessoal passa atrás, né? O pessoal não precisa ficar passando <risos> na frente, ou eu ficar no meio do caminho, tá naquele, dando aquele olé. Mas é, é, é uma coisa incrível. É, tem um espaço inteiro do evento para lá, assim. A galera, eles acumulam onde tá a câmera, na frente da câmera. É muito louco isso, né? É, é, coisas da vida. Coisas da vida. E, bom, tô segurando aqui o... o o microfone na mão, né? Porque. Hum, não sei colocar. Ó, já estão voltando já. Vocês... Ah, outra coisa que vocês devem ter percebido é que o estoniano ele é estrito em questão de horário. Não tem ideia. A outra guria que atrasou a... o começo da apresentação dela, tipo, o problema dela. O cara cortou a apresentação e falou: A gente entende que atrasou sua palestra, mas está no horário. E manda sair do palco, não tem nem choro nem vela. E não tem mimimi, né? Deu o horário, acabou, saiu do palco, segue a vida. Então, tá começando a última. É, é a última agora? Não é a última ainda, né? Tem S mais uma, tá? Então tem S mais uma. É, eu coloquei uma bateria aqui para segurar, mas o celular tá caindo. A, é, porque eu liguei o, o gimbal, o Paul e o celular. O celular tá caindo a bateria, mas tá mais devagar. Então acho que vai segurar, vamos ver. Vamos lá. Você vê isso? Sim. Ok, bem, obrigado muito por sua apresentação. Meu nome é Mons Gallifus e eu sou sort of professor da Universidade de Copenhague. Eu tenho um grupo de pesquisa que se foca em entender os básicos mecanismos que o drive do aging, o drive do fenotipo do aging. Então, um, why do we develop brain up here, facial wrinkles, these are some of the sort of superficial things that occur while we age. And of course, other sub habits, we, we get vulnerable and, uh, and um, can, can become sick. And in the end, of course, we all die. That's the, the, pressure, the, the, the depressing start to this uh, talk. Uh, so my, my lab uses this methodology, so we look at aging from inside run that through uh, various computational algorithms and then we can test stuff in the lab both in, in humans, in fruit flies and in, in mice and other, also other organisms. And we can then test the dimensions to see if we can then actually affect uh, phenotype of aging in, in humans. And so why should we actually care about, about uh, aging? So One reason why we should care about aging is sort of the societal uh, angle. So every society in the world uh, is getting older. So the, the proportion of older adults, uh, the proportion of individuals aged 65 and more is, is increasing globally. And at the same time, we are experiencing a decrease in the, uh, in the birth rates. And that, um, you know, will pose a, a problem in the future because Typically, healthcare costs, for example, are, uh, are, uh, are mostly occurring uh, in the old adults. And of course, uh, retired individuals do not contribute as much to taxes and, as other people. So, so there will be a, a socioeconomic challenge as we, as, as, uh, in, the, in the coming decades. <laughs> From a personal perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's also kind of dangerous to grow old. So this is a, uh, a graph where we can see the deaths per 1,000 uh, individuals per year, uh, and uh, then it's and that's it. So uh, targeted into age groups here, and you can see that with age, the, uh, almost all um, or all diseases actually show exponential growth in the the uh, incidence with. with And so if you put this in, in other words, so if you are really not um, treating yourself very nicely, if you smoke, if you drink alcohol, if you have a high BMI, if you are, do not do any sports exercise, and if you uh, eat poorly, you increase your risk of developing cancer by 76%. So this is quite a large number, uh, of course, and um, It's an important number because these are things that you can actually do something about quite easily by changing your behavior. But if we go from being 10 years old 
and age to 60, and then look at the risk of developing cancer in the subsequent 30 years, you actually increase your risk of developing cancer by 3,500%. So in other words, it's much, 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 much worse uh, to grow old than, than it is to, for example, smoke. Uh, but of course, if, you, uh, if you're combining these two, then they compound, then you will increase your risk by 6,000% instead. But this is just to point out that, that during aging, something fundamental happens that really makes us vulnerable to, to many diseases. So what is aging? So I, um, I was at a conference uh, a couple of years ago in, uh, in the US with a researcher called Barry Gladyshev, who, uh, who's from Harvard. He asked this question, what is aging? And we were 200 uh, aging researchers at the meeting, and, and there was actually no agreement to what aging really is. Um, so I like this very simple definition that aging is a, something that occurs over time, so it's a time-dependent process. Uh, and it's a time-dependent process that increases your risk of death. So this is really the bare bone, I would say, uh, uh, definition of aging as, as I like to use it. And so in other words, it looks like this. Um, so um, as we get older, our risk of dying increases. And it's actually, it actually increases. So, so our risk of dying actually doubles every eight year when we're 30. So when we're 38, it's twice as high as when we're 30. When it's 46, it's four times as high. When we are 54, it's eight times as high and so forth. So it's an exponentially growing function. And so it looks a little bit like this. This is data from the Social Security Administration, the, the risk of dying the following year as a function of your age. And as you can see, um, men have a slightly fast increase than women. And men also live uh, uh, typically shorter than women. So we can translate that into survival curves. This is for, for the Danish population. So this is the number of people alive, so the proportion, this is 100% are alive at age zero. And then, uh, as a function of age, of course, parts of the population will, will pass away. And we can see that the mean age is around uh, 50 years here. So this uh, curve is, is uh, not so exciting, but in Denmark we have really ex exceptionally good registries. So we, um, we, we basically, basically record uh, every, everything that individuals do, uh, healthcare-wise, but also uh, socially and tax-wise. And, and, and we, we link that through a, a number. So that means that we can actually connect individuals' uh, life trajectories to, to stuff that they're doing. And one of the things we did, particularly at this, this uh, longevity molecule, Project, we, we combined the, uh, the um, mortality database, so data on when people were born and when they died, with the uh, pharmacy database. So that means that, that we can identify compounds that are associated with longer lifespans and shorter lifespans. So each line here is a, um, is a group of individuals that have been giving, given uh, one compound, so we've grouped them together. And so there are more than 3,500 compounds in this, this, um, in this um, graph here. And uh, the, the guy that made this, um, he, he's, uh, he's from Canada, and obviously, as we all are, kind of interested in the American uh, presidential race. So he terms this plot the Trump plot. I'm sure you can. Uh, understand. Um, but uh, obviously uh, we can see that there's some compounds associated with longer life and some with shorter life. And one of the things that we started out looking at was metformin, uh, which is a, a drug that has been shown to affect, or that is used in type 2 diabetes. And there was, there's been some work showing that uh, individuals that get metformin, uh, if you're very old, get prescribed metformin, then you actually have a reduced uh, mortality rate compared to healthy individuals. 
So we looked at that as one of the first things. And so this is the survival curve. So for the red one is everybody, the blue one is metformin users. If we don't have any cutoff, then metformin use is associated with a short lifespan. But if we look at very old people that get metformin, you actually see a survival benefit initially, and that kind of crosses over in later on. So that suggests that metformin could be impacted and life and health span, and there's actually research looking into this. But of course, all of these drugs are, you don't get a drug unless you have a diagnosis. So there's a strong confounder uh, by diagnosis that, that could impact how we interpret data. And so to avoid or to reduce this diagnostic bias, we look for um, compounds that increase lifespan, but also convert survival benefits against other compounds given to the same diagnosis. So each uh, column here represents one diagnosis for the diagnostic code down here has been given where, where we can see a variety of drugs that have been given, given to us this diagnosis. So each dog here is, is a one type of drug. And so you can see that some drugs confer quite significant survival benefit versus others. So we investigated that and selected three compounds, compound X, Y, and Z which had a quite significant increase in the, associated with a, in, an increase in the survival. And these compounds were then actually the basis of, uh, of, of why I'm here, so the, the longevity molecule. And the idea is, and I think that you've already heard a little bit from, uh, from the Vita Dao people, the idea with this uh, with this uh, approach was that that a, a community was formed basically um, initially actually around um, I think financing this uh, um, this research and that community then gains ownership of the, the intellectual property that's generated in the research proposal. So these compounds here, we uh, generated funds to, uh, to investigate these compounds. And then the, the intellectual property that was developed from these compounds would then fall to members of Vita Dao, or Vita Dao community as a whole, basically. So this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a crypto guy, I'm a researcher, I'm a medical doctor as a, as a background. And, uh, and so uh, I thought it was fascinating that maybe everybody could get co-ownership of, of a drug that could, that could help everyone, right? This is really why I do science, because I, I want to discover interventions that can fit everybody that got a little bit healthier for a little bit longer. And so, so it was very exciting. I think to participate in this, and so um, basically uh, the the IP that was uh, contained in the in, in this project um, was then made into an NFT, and then uh, an NFT was uh, was transferred from Molecule to uh, to Visa DAO, holding this uh, holding this IP, and that I think was the first example of uh, an IP NFT. So I'm very happy that, that uh, I was part of this, but this is definitely something that Molecule and Visa Dao, those are the guys that actually made it happen. Um, and this was highlighted in one of the major uh, articles in, in uh, our newspapers in, in science, it's called Nature Biotech, which is uh, one of the largest uh, scientific outlets in, in, the, in the scientific field. And so they, uh, Notice this because it's sort of a very unique way of, uh, of, of uh, looking at how we can develop drugs. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an uh, overview of some of the findings that we did. So we, we had two uh, intervention or two uh, parts of the project. One was looking at cells, human cells, and looking at something called senescence, and the other one was looking at uh, something. Uh, looking at fruit flies and using those as a model of aging. So fruit flies only live 
to max on 80 days, which means that you can you can test uh, expansions quite quickly uh, in fruit flies. But I'll tell you about the, the cell culture work <laughs> where we tested it in human cell lines to see if we could impact senescence. And the way we did this was we we um, we took the cells, we put them in in these uh, three uh, eight four well plates, and then we irradiate them with ionizing radiation to make them old, basically to age them rapidly, and then we can give the drugs so that we can see how we impact the synthesis. So what is cellular synthesis? So cellular synthesis, I usually call them this. This is a, a, a sort of a self bait. So you, you probably all know that we're made out of a lot of different cells in our body. And when cells get damaged, then they can lose their purpose. So we have muscle cells, we have fat cells, we have skin cells, we have cells that produce connective tissue. And when they get damaged, they can lose their, their basically lose their purpose. They, they lose their function, their morphology changes. And then they, um, they secrete these inflammatory cytokines, so they make the, the microenvironment around them worse. And so they have been shown to be quite bad for, for aging. If you remove them from mice, then they're the mice longer. So we have developed uh, ways to actually quantify these cells using uh, deep neural networks that can identify cells. So this is a picture of, of cells. These, what you see here, are nuclei of cells, so small. And parts of our cells that contain the DNA. And we can actually identify senescent cells based on the shape of the nuclei using T neural networks. And so we have this ensemble of neural networks that quite uh, accurately can predict uh, senescence. So we tested, we used this for our testing uh, uh, cell lines, and we actually did quite a large number of different experiments. It, uh, and um, we had to actually identified three compounds, compound X, C, and J5, which um, I'm just going to highlight the graphs here at the right. So these compounds reduce the amount of senescent cells and increase the amount of senescent cells. And so this is different doses of the compounds. And with increasing doses, you, you change the, 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 the cells from being predicted senescence to non senescent. We've also combined these um, these compounds to uh, and, and see there's actually a potentiation uh, between these different compounds. So you don't have to use quite as high dose if you actually use two of the compounds at the same time. So uh, just sort of the take-home message, we, we screen more than 3,500 compounds, looking at more than 1 billion prescription data sets uh, for a population of 5 million people. And uh, we then identified 11 compounds that we tested in three different human cell lines. And three of those 11 compounds show an effect on cellular senescence. And I think what's interesting is that three compounds potentiate each other. So they could actually uh, potentially be used together and maybe even generate uh, sort of a specific intellectual property that could be pursued. Uh, and I think what's interesting here is about all of these data, the IP between all, behind all this data actually belongs to me So, um, So this was, I think, I mean, Really interesting to, to, to push this forward, and uh, if there any anyone who's who's uh, who's thinking about pursuing this type of uh, financing, I highly encourage it. It's uh, it's been uh, I think a quite incredible journey. And so this is uh, this is my group. This is from a lab photo from our lab retreat last year, and uh, these are some of our funding uh, sources. Some of our collaboration partners, and of course, I want to highlight Mr. Dow here. Um, and I think that uh, I will take any questions if you guys have any questions. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. So I will kick off with uh, two questions. 
Uh, first is what was sort of like the scope of this initial uh, IPNF3? What was it uh, also like a uh, research plan? What you will do and or or was it like an initial patent application? What was really the scope? Like how much of future research of this will be covered by BetaDAO? So what's the limit of the identified compounds? And the second question in relation, uh, was it easy to actually negotiate with the university to enter this kind of transaction? And how, how did, what was the anticipation of the welcoming of this? So this is a, this is a great question. So, uh, so the scope of the IP was the contract behind the, the to actually do the work, basically. Um, and so, um, so it was not the patent uh, application, or um, but, uh, but the actual kind of work and whatever IP that was generated from the work fell to the to the holder of the IP. Um, for the the tech trans uh, the university. Uh, communication that was, uh, I would say, challenging. Actually, before this, I met every other week with, uh, with Tyler Bellas and Paul Polis from Molecule uh, for, for two years. Before this, it was really a long process and I had many, many, many talks with our tech trans office because they didn't really understand it. And initially, <clears throat> when, I, when we were discussing that that there might be, you know, two thousand IP holders. Uh, then uh, they got, uh, they started sweating, you know, and, and, uh, because uh, if there had to be changes in, in some sort of contract layout and all, in principle, all two thousand IP holders should should sign off on it, right? But I think the solution was to have this entity, the Tabao entity, which is really the the one, the single entity that holds the IP, which means that. That you don't need, you know, individual uh, contracts with individual IP holders. So, um, so I think in the end it, it worked out, but it was really uh, it was a long process, and, and um, I mean I'm very happy that other universities have have, uh, have pursued this after uh, we did it. So, so I think this is something that that that, uh, that seemed to work. Uh, would they do it again and they have been they following up what's happening in the research space or what, what the reception is at the, at the moment? They so so, I'm, so I, I've been talked to tech, I've been invited to talk to other tech trans offices. I think the, the tech trans office at, the, at my university is completely overloaded with the, with, with the things that so they will not proactively seek out this, but I have been to other actually invited to other universities to, to talk about this uh, funding strategy. Um, I, th I mean, I think it can definitely be done again. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, if the right idea is there, if the right project is there, if uh, if there's interest from from entities, then this can of course be done again. Uh, any questions from audience? Yeah, there's one for Marcus from Tech University. Yeah, just a quick question. So, the Vita DAO is a registered entity in uh, Denmark as a non profit, or what, what is that entity? So, I can't actually remember where Vita DAO is registered, but uh, it's, it has nothing to do with the, with the University of Denmark. It's registered somewhere else. Uh, I think it's in, registered in the US, actually. Um, Australia? No, it's Canada. Is yeah. it Canada? Yeah. I can't remember. But it's, it's not a non profit, right? Because they also invest in companies, and I think for if, if you think about um, the whole idea with with these DAO is to make an ecosystem that can be propagated, that can continue. And I think you know funding a project like mine was uh, was is is risky and was a start. And I think it gained some publicity, but the um, the path to making a profit out of this is probably long, right? So they've also started investing in companies, so they've done equity deals and tried to mix up equity deals, so deals where they buy shares of a company or pass of a company or finance a company. Um, and then combine that with, with also these sort of more basic approaches. And I think this is something that will will have to be done to make it sustainable. 
because otherwise it's the the path to profit is it's very very long. Right. Any other questions from the audience? If not, then thank you very much. This was really insightful, and I hope that the University of Copenhagen will continue to look into new <laughs> new ways of doing commercialization. So, thanks once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Bye -bye. So this was this side Nordics, it was really just an experiment and, and, and the kickoff to, to engage in these communications with different people and stakeholders in the field. I hope there will be a continuation. We will definitely uh, will engage more in the internet, so we will set up some accounts or you can already join up to our Telegram. Uh, if you scan this QR code, it goes to the event page, but the event page actually has a link to the Telegram chat. But we will set up maybe LinkedIn and Twitter account, and also um, Anka has this uh, podcast series, and it's in the event page. Please listen to that. Um, and now it's pretty open to any kind of announcements and open mics. Uh, we still have some coffee, and I just learned that someone is actually from Mexico here and have been in Europe for a while. Was a random location, so. around the world having that and also in this side we want to communicate all the scientific 
work and it means that need to be open for everyone. So all the data needs to be there to be replicable and also um, well, it's available in on-chain. So all, other thing that this I that this I improve is the IP ownership. So in traditional science institution and all, and also even if the government is funding your project is the owner of your IP but in this I you can you can you can have agreements between the DAO and and the researcher labs so This is the decentralized science landscape, Ooh. and if you see, there are only three communities from Latin America. Well, Design Mexico is not there yet, but we have Design Latam, Design Brazil, and Desire that is a platform to to publish your articles. Well, if you see the percentage of here, signs around the world, you can see that uh, European Union, US, and, and China contribute the most percentage in publication. And only 1% correspond to these countries, and only one country from Latin America is contributing to 0.8% from this 1%. So the global, the global scientific production is is taken by three by test three. And if we need to see more closer, you can see that in Latin America only we have one researcher per one thousand labor force. So um, it is a big problem because we we don't have uh, more people going to science and in my experience talking with our researchers they are leaving their career because of academia. So, and also, I, I take this uh, graphic from, from the ONU research, and you can see that in Latin America and Caribbean, only we have 5% and the growth is very small. So, for years only grow 0.2%. You see the GDFP also in Mexico and Latin America. We are under the 1%. So it's supposed that we need to have 1% for funding, but we, we have only 0.3%. And this is that that the government said that the reality is older. And you can see in the next slide. But first of all, uh, we. We, I will talk about the most common problems in science in Mexico, and one of one of these is financing. In academia, we have oh, there are a lot of competition, so all the researchers that worry about their PhD or obtain a better grade know to do science, and also their application. Most of the works in science are not reproducible. So we can know if this data is valid and communication. Science is inaccessible. So if you want to publish an article, you need to buy do you need to pay for a publish and then if you can access to the article you need to pay another fee to access the article. So it don't it doesn't have sense. And but what is happening in Mexico? In Mexico, they are spending more in operations, less on research. So we have a budget to supposed to be directed in science, but the truth is is that less than fifty percent is directed to real scientific fields. And I put an example here. Here, only a, a single agency in Mexico is receiving. Uh, 579 percent of all these budgets and they are not doing research they are doing operations and actually every sexenium we change of president and in this sexenium um, the investment for science decreased 32 percent and also if we in the past we have only 
um, 11 programs, now we have only three for funding projects in academia or in research in general. In general. And I think the problem is from also uh, from education uh, and take this, this graph from OECD members and we are in the third worst place. <laughs> Mexico is here. This is Grecia, <laughs> then Colombia, and in the third place is Mexico. And it's important to have more education or more investment in education. That is one of the goals of this and Mexico also. And, and also I want to show you the postgraduate is to this in Latin America that is so important to obtain uh, your your reputation in the scientific environment and Mexico comparing with the OECD members we have the lowest percentage in higher education in higher technical programs and doctoral programs and it, 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 I am comparing with these countries that has the most programs in education and Mexico is under of, of these countries I'm talking more, talking more about publication Latin America has four uh, journals where all the Latin American researchers publish and also other, other researchers around the world if they want that is Latin Index, Cielo, Red Alica, America but um, they, you can publish in Spanish and also in English but I think this, this is a problem because these journals doesn't have the impact around the world to to be recognized, so the scientists, if they publish there um, and they are looking for a place in a, in a, in a laboratory with other research groups that publish in nature, so they don't have the same, the same opportunities. And also happens a lot of plagiarism, and I think when we decide uh, we, can, we can solve this because all the information is unchained. And there is no declaration of conflicts of interest, so we don't know we, what, who is the people that are evaluating the projects in, in traditional science. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, and also predatory journals. There are many journals that doesn't have um, um, they are not verifiable, so they are fake and they take the works and then disappear. And I will talk about Design Mexico and about us. We are a recent community. We formed this community in October the last year. And first of all, we are focused on teach uh, students, teach the researchers and also our, our partners to know more about blockchain and of course for design. So the first of all, we are teaching them like what is not chain, what is a wallet. And we are focused in scientific dissemination. We work some articles in Spanish because all the information about this side is in English. So we spread the word in Spanish. We onboard the scientists. We promote the use of blockchain tools that we are there, that are in the ecosystem. And we, we teach how to use them. Ex we explain what existing BioDAOs and how they can involve in each BioDAO and we are like incubator projects to, to postulate in these BioDAOs. And our, and our, first, our first goal now is create platforms that solve the problems in Mexico. And one of these is women's health, metabolic syndrome and diabetes that is too high in Mexico and around the world. Psychiatric illness as well as pet data. This is more focused on, on environmental biology, sustainable flora management, and catalogs of flora and fauna species because we have a lot of biodiversity, but they are in, in dangerous because there are no protection for them. So we need to investigate and put this information um, on chain. So this is our roadmap for this year. We, we gave our first international conference in Zurich and we are going to do our first conference workshop in our university at WAP that is a public university in Puebla, Mexico 
So we are going to talk about design and how to be your DAOs and we are teaching about how to create the wallet, how to participate in research group and some other activities. And we are working in our decentralized science podcast in Spanish. And we are doing our website because we don't have fans yet and we are looking for that. We are working in in investigation principle Please. And first, we are working in the, all the underfunded areas and we are going to put in a platform. And we are looking for collaboration with more communities and ecosystem. We are going to enter the rounds for fundraising for this in Mexico. And we are doing an investigation in this letter that there are, some, that is, that there are uh, parasitic plants. And we are looking for take the seeds and take the visit for and neurophysiology research. So, well, we are starting in Puebla with the urban trees. And I think this is our participation. We are new business. <laughs> and I gave some conference in Puebla and also I was in the molecule offices and I met all the people in the biodiverse. And, and I participate in the hackathon at the H5 de Mayo, that is one of the biggest hackathon in Latin America now. And we put the, for first time the DSA drive for the hackers. And we gave uh, $3,000 in, in prices thanks to Validao that support us, also VitaDAO, AtinaDAO, CerebrumDAO, and um, DSA work. Um, thank you so much for your attention and if you, you want to follow us, this is our uh, website it's, and uh, that's all. I don't, I don't know if you have questions. Um, thank you so much. I understand that this is the topic what, what many doesn't want to discuss, 
uh, because it's very, uh, first of all, complicated, second of all, it might uh, sometimes show uh, some facts in a different way from how people market uh, their um, projects, right? And um, the DAO, um, what we have, uh, the information that we have got from research papers uh, that do research uh, the uh, how many scams, for example, are in the DAO space. Uh, we don't want to believe, but it is that approximately 70 up to 80 percent of the actual DAOs are, we can call them scams, because they don't actually do what they promise and um, they are not legally, um, we can say, not legally valid. And uh, the rest, which uh, we can, we don't want to call scams, the rest are very confused. A uh, few of them only um, have the real budget for the compliance, because the compliance is very expensive, as we know that. Um, but what we see as a trend in the DAO industry is currently that uh, because, like, design, for example, is a very good example, is entering the space of DAOs, generally what I can say, then it means that um, corporates, universities and these kind of structures which are already having the legal entities, they want to have more compliance, they want to do the QAC, they're okay to do the QAC. So, and um, that is leading us also to better economy in, in the DAO space. Um, so, what else do... Um, to quickly mention, we have researched many white papers and documentations of um, famous DAOs and I don't want to go to the names because um, one thing is there, it's rapidly changing and many DAOs are you know, researching the area and if they don't have currently the solution, they really want and they're willing to uh, solve the problem because nobody wants to be in front of the set of uh, uh, security, uh, so, so nobody wants to be in front in front of the U.S. court, you know, and get into jail where the, uh, uh, unfortunately, the crypto hackers uh, go these days. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you want to you ask something? Yeah. L last year, uh, our search showed us like 0.3% of the, all the community happening in the crypto space. Well, well all the... On top of all the volume and total volume of transactions, just 0.3 was like for, for fraud and criminals and everything. Why do you think it's so concentrated in the DAO space? Because as you said, like the number of DAOs is coming, it's huge. So if all of the crypto being transacted is like 0.3, they are for fraud, what's happening? What do you think is happening in the DAO space for concentrating all the that amount of frauds. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, it's a very good question. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, I, um, yeah, the previously mentioned number that 80 or 70 percentage of the DAOs are scams. This is only about the DAOs, not the whole crypto itself, you know, yeah. So, and, and yes, this information is like probably you, we are referring to uh, a chain link or chain analysis report. Yes, that 0.3 percentage of the money laundering is happening. Um, in crypto and the rest is going on in banks and we, we know where, in the charities and so on. Um, and the reason, we know that the reason, yes. So if we go to um, anti-money laundering uh, conferences, uh, etc., we don't see many pro-crypto people there. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I came out of the AML, which is anti-money laundering industry, I didn't want to work there because uh, I don't want to be this, this small person working for a big corporation or a big uh, company where you have to do the QIC, uh, you have to be the compliance uh, officer um, and you see that, mm, mm, sorry but I'm just a tool for others to make money and to launder money actually. So AML is for many just to launder more money. And of course, it's very complicated to launder money if there is more transparency, if there is uh, more um, information and data on chain. And uh, no, nobody wants really crypto to enter to the finance, and also nobody wants them to the crowdfunding. Nobody wants uh, transparency, transparency in charity. 
Uh, we have in Estonia also bad charity cases. We have regards to the Ukraine uh, funding. We have, uh, I mean, probably everybody knows uh, how US is funding the Ukraine war right now. How much actual DAO would help there and the transparency. I mean, can it actually help? Or it will make it very bad at the political situation. So I guess the, the work that we are working on with, it's a very risky area. And that's why it's, um, it's not very supported by the um, central <laughs> systems. Yeah. I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Any other questions somebody wants to discuss? Anything? Uh, are the tokens, uh, voting tokens, are under the Mika? Uh, are the voting tokens under the Mika? Voting, uh, same, same, same. you can vote. Um, you know, uh, it depends what kind of token you have. So you can vote with different type of tokens. You can vote with the governance token, you can vote also with the security token. It depends what kind of right to give to the token, right? So, and, um, and um, we can say that... Um, uh, short question, uh, short answer is yes, they are under Mika, but it depends on your token, right? Uh, it's very hard to define and to say that um, right now on stage what type of token cannot be under the Mika because uh, it depends on your specific uh, project and uh, how did you uh, calculate your documentation, what is actually happening there. So it has to be uh, case by case analyzed. So that, that's the very complicated part actually. Because uh, if we talk about DeFi, uh, literally decentralized uh, projects or decentralized uh, organization, then uh, uh, it is not included in NICA, which means that uh, there has to be case by case analyzed. And um, this is where lawyers come in, this is where money comes in, and this is where we lose a lot of uh, power. So, yeah. Okay, but I guess uh, any, any more questions or we can wrap up? Yeah. Maybe just a quick uh, head up, heads up then that uh, we are located also in Estonia and happy to uh, connect and uh, collaborate and uh, see where the further it goes. And thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you everyone. And hope to build continue this in the future. And, and yeah, <laughs> we will reconnect in the digital space and last first from Andreas. Bom pessoal, então aqui a gente está encerrando, né? Eu acho que deu quase 5 horas de live, é bastante. O microfonezinho aguentou, tá tudo, né? A bateria, eu coloquei uma, consegui plugar uma bateria externa aqui, carregou um pouquinho o gimbal. O celular estava descarregando mais devagar, o que já valeu. Então acho que é isso, vou ficando por aqui. Valeu quem ficou na live aí. Agora eu vou para casa descansar, né? Porque, pô, 5 horas, tô de pé aqui. Eu e a Miriam aqui atrás da câmera o tempo todo, segurando a bronca aqui para vocês. Espero que vocês tenham gostado. Depois eu vou tentar separar o vídeo, fazer, sei lá, um novo canal para subir essas coisas em inglês. E é isso. Ah, então, um ótimo final de semana para todo mundo. Sextou, boa sexta-feira. A gente se vê na próxima segunda com mais um Morning Crypto. O que foi? Sextou hoje, não é sexta? Que dia que é hoje? Hoje é quinta? Hoje é quinta-feira, hoje não é sexta? Tem certeza? Nossa, então hoje é, hoje é quinta. Se hoje é quinta-feira, não sextou nada. Eu tô fora de rumo. É amanhã tem morning cripto. <risos> eu tô achando que hoje é sexta já. E a produção tá assim, como assim? Como assim? <risos> então é isso, galera. Amanhã tem morning cripto. Então não tem final de semana nem nada. Eu vejo vocês amanhã. <risos> Se cuidem. <risos> Fique seguro, juízo, juízo com seus investimentos. Amanhã a gente volta com morning cripto. Obrigado por tudo. Até mais e tchau. <risos> Fui. Essa é a mão da produção. Oh meu Deus, tô ficando maluco.